All right, good evening and welcome to regular meeting of council for Monday, June 27th. And we're gonna start with the singing of O Canada and then do a moment of reflection and then we'll come back for the land acknowledgement. So over to the council coordinator. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. Carlton Brasse Porte Le Pea. Il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des plus brillantes exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, can we stand on God for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on God for All right, so um, just want to start with land acknowledgement. And last week we had the uh, Indigenous Solidarity Day that was here at uh, City Hall, it took place on, on the uh, City Hall stairs. Then there was a, an event that took place at the library and then there was a wonderful uh, Take Back the Land Solidarity con concert at First Ontario Performing Arts Centre. So it was wonderful to see community come together and also listen to both the music and, and the words uh, from Indigenous members of our community. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge that the land on which Council meets today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to uh, live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Acknowledging this is a great reminder of our standard of living. It is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. And uh, last week, I had an opportunity, Councillor Phillips was there as well, and uh, the Strong Water Singers opened up a conference that we were at, and we were at the uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, uh, Initiatives con uh, Conference in Niagara. And it was, a, it was a wonderful way to open up the, um, the conference because uh, one of the, the lead singers, Patty, uh, who talked about relationships and talked about the importance of indigenous teachings and uh, in, in how we approach both land and water in terms of conservation and, and protecting our resources. And, and she, was, she reminded us that uh, relationships are important and that's what the foundation of indigenous communities are built on is strong relationships and so, wanting to deepen our, our bond with our Indigenous brothers and sisters as well through learning, understanding, and reconciliation. And so I think last week was an important week on many fronts. And it's, uh, I just want to thank city staff again for uh, taking the opportunity to prepare the space so that we could host these events. And at the same time, there's a number of city staff that came out and joined us for that day. And uh, it was... It was it made me feel very proud to be the mayor of the city when you see the kind of turnout from both staff and other members of our community. Uh, we do have uh, just a, a, a brief uh, mayor's report, but there's some really exciting things that happened over the weekend as well. Uh, the FireFit competition, which is a national competition that is held across the country, was held here in St. Catharines for the first time at the Seymour Hannah Sports Entertainment Complex. 
and described as the toughest two minutes in sport. About 100 firefighters from Ontario and Quebec came to our community to compete over two days. And not only was St. Catharines a great host, it was one of the first fire fit competitions since pre-pandemic. And our St. Catharines competitors did extremely well. The first winner ever in St. Catharines was a St. Catharines firefighter, one of our own. Captain Daryl Amos won the overall individual event. And that's a very hard, hard title to secure. And Daryl, who's in amazing shape, uh, did an outstanding job in a very complex course. Daryl wasn't done there. Done, done there. He teamed up with Ryan Coglin from St. Catharines, who won the two-person tandem Tech Two race. Firefighter Kevin Coffey played first with the fastest time in the over 40 division. In the team time competition, St. Catharines had one team finish first overall, and another finished third. St. Catharines also captured a first and second place in team relay. And so, good luck to the winners as they head to Fire Fit Worlds and the Canadian National Championships in September in Alberta. And I just say I want to give a special thanks to all the volunteers, the St. Catharines Fire Combat Team, for hosting this event and bringing out competitors and their families to our community. We're hoping that this can be a more regular event that takes place in St. Catharines. The Seymour Hanna Complex was a perfect location for this. And in talking to the organizer of FireFit, uh, he's looking to bring the Nationals back to our community and or back to our community for a first time. And the, based on the show that we put on this past weekend, I think we made a very strong case that hosting a national event, which would bring in thousands of people, would bring in hundreds of competitors from across the country, would be a great opportunity to shine a light on St. Catharines. I'd also like to congratulate Shelley Locke, the winner of this year's Mayor's Poetry Challenge that's held every April to promote literacy, arts, culture, and reading in our community. The Canada Games inspired theme led to some great entries this year, including a large number from local students. It was a challenge to, to, to choose the best poem, the one that stood out the most, but Shelley's poem, A Time to Cheer, was the one that stood, ab stood above all else. Uh, she captured the, the theme perfectly and receives a $200 monetary uh, award. And a talented writer and artist, I'm honored to read Shelley's poem. So it's titled, A Time to Cheer. The world is changing, unfolding in ways unimaginable. Intangible forces invade our thoughts, stirring minds in frantic ways. Let's halt the grains of the hourglass for a brief moment in time, amidst a shared distraction with the ability to unite. For all to come together, let differences melt like ice after rain. We can strengthen our kinship. Forging heroes through sport, we celebrate sacrifice. We celebrate hope, influencing the societal change to build coval uh, covalent bonds. A time to cheer teammates and, and crowd, aligned as allied as one to uh, sweat together, to bleed together, for hope is played out on the field and has the power to dispel our cultural divides. So I just want to say thank you to Shelley and all the others who entered this year's challenge. Uh, this is, well, obviously, it's the, it's the final year of the, um, the, the, the Mayor's Poetry Challenge in my term. My hope is that the next mayor, whoever it may be, he or she may be, will look at this as an opportunity uh, to continue to promote the arts in our community. We also have the Trillium Awards coming up. So if you're in your neighborhoods, you have neighbors who have built beautiful properties, we encourage you to go to the city's website to submit a nomination. There are so many beautiful properties here in our community. Let's shine a light on them, whether it be residential or commercial. They're all eligible to participate. And let's get the nominations in to help celebrate some of the talented green thumbs in St. Catharines. We also have the outdoor pools have arrived in terms of the outdoor pool season and the outdoor pools are set to open June 30th. On opening day, Port Luzi and Lion Dunk Schoolie will open at 1 p.m. and Lincoln Park at 11.30 a.m. Visit the city's website for complete details. Canada Day long weekend is a busy one, including the return of Canada Day festivals to Rennie Park. City staff have planned a family-friendly celebration with games, a community art mural, sunflower planting, and a photo booth, live entertainment, and more. A limited number of free picnic bags or are also still available to be claimed. Go to the city's website for more information. After a two-year hiatus, the Port Luzi Supper Market is back, and that's Tuesdays at Lakeside Park, 4 p.m. to dusk with food trucks, fresh produce, and live entertainment, and that goes until August 30th. It's also a chance to enjoy the Lakeside Park, walk on the piers, enjoy the waterfront, ride the carousel in July and August. As well, Cirque du Soleil is set to push the boundaries of performance on ice when it skates into the Meridian Centre June 30th to July 3rd for the new show Crystal. It's the only Canadian stop for the show, 
And so we're looking forward to welcoming thousands of people in our community to see this show over those four or five days at the beginning of July. Also, Born and Raised is taking place at Montebello Park, June 30th to July 3rd, as it serves as a homecoming for some very talented artists. Four nights of concerts will take place, headed by City in Color and Alexis on Fire, who forged their way onto the music scene right here in St. Catharines. There's a great lineup each day with bands like Broken Social Scene, Sam Roberts, Billy Talon, and many more. And there will be some disruptions, and there will be some closures around the park this week for the event, including the setup in advance. So I ask that people please be patient as we welcome these bands back, and we welcome the thousands of visitors who will be coming to our community over those four days. Again, it's a great opportunity not just for the Montebello Park, but it's also for the surrounding businesses, and also to shine a light on the great things that are happening here in St. Catharines. Also, um, I want to talk about Again, last week, I had, had an opportunity with Councillor Phillips to participate in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative Annual General Meeting. I've been the chair for the past year, and I've been on the board since 2014. It's a very important organization made up of 150 Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River mayors, including many from across the province. I was proud to showcase Niagara Region to more than 100 delegates participating in the events who visited Port Luzi, the St. Catharines Museum, and Welland Canal Centre as well as a number of other sites across the region. I'm also proud to have an organization like this that furthers the cause that we here at the City of St. Catharines believe in as well, which is the protection of our water and the environmental issues that we're facing and how we can all deal with it as municipalities. We had an opportunity to also endorse the Ontario Marine Strategy, something that these, this council has been actively pursuing through the province of Ontario, as well as, as, well a, as another uh, on, on a, a other canal um, communities such as Port Coburn, Thorold, and, and, and Welland. And so we're looking forward to meeting again with Minister of Transportation, Carolyn Moroni, and she has indicated she is supportive of the city's call for a strategy. We're hoping to get that in, in a green light now that the new government has been formed and actively working on that. I also want to just give a special thank you to Tom Rankin and the Rankin family. Uh, they have donated a significant amount of funds to the Niagara Health Foundation, helping to raise $2.8 million to support MRI units last year. They've stepped up time and time again, and they've stepped up again to support the South Niagara new hospital that is scheduled to be built with a $2 million donation. And I raise that because here's a St. Catharines-based company that's investing its dollars into other parts of the community. And my hope is that it'll, it'll showcase that, you know, I was on the It's Our Time campaign here in, in St. Catharines to build the, the hospital in St. Catharines, and there wasn't a lot of Niagara based businesses outside of St. Catharines, Thorold, Niagara on Lake that stepped up. Um, and here you have Rankin supporting a South Niagara, so I hope, I hope that's a signal to other Niagara Falls based companies and Fort Erie based companies that, you know, when it comes to supporting these kind of larger projects, um, we all need to chip in. It just can't be one or two or three communities. It needs to be a... So Tom Rankin and his family are leading by example. Um, I'd also like to end with a special virtual presentation, one that showcases the leadership of the City of St. Catharines and City Council. I'd like to welcome Ann Coleman, Program Director for the Ontario Living Wage Network, and Lori Klein-Smith of the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network. I'm proud to have them join us to announce that the City is officially a certified living wage employer, the largest municipality in Ontario to begin the living wage process. As part of this certification, the City has pledged to meet champion level requirements to 2024. While full-time employees are paid a living wage, this means part-time staff and employees of the City contractors will be brought up at least the minimum threshold of a living wage by 2024. So I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and I would like to acknowledge that uh, Councillor Miller and Councillor Porter were very active in pushing the City to moving forward on the, on the living wage as well. And so I just want to acknowledge their efforts as Council. We all had agreed to do this, but there was a push that came from council as well and it was greatly appreciated. So, Anne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mayor and Cal uh, Council. And uh, Lori, I'm really pleased that you're able to be here with me today as well. Uh, Lori's from the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network and uh, she and her, the whole network have just been very supportive of the living wage work that has been done um, within the Niagara region. Uh, the living wage is the hourly wage a worker needs to earn to cover not just their basic expenses, but to have a little extra to participate in community. 
And this is really important because there are many people who are working full time, making minimum wage or low wage, and are still living in poverty. Um, so when people are earning the living wage, it, it's really meant to uh, get them out of poverty. Um, Thank you so much for the commitment um, that you have made to make sure that all of everyone that works for the city of St. Catharines is earning a living wage. Um, this really shows a lot of care uh, for the community and respect for people who are working uh, within your community. It's also a really great example for other employers within the city of St. Catharines um, and within the Niagara region and a great uh, example as well for other municipalities in Ontario and really across the country. So a huge congratulations to the city of St. Catharines for becoming a certified living wage employer. Thank you, Anne, and appreciate the, the kind words. Lori, do you wanna, do you wanna add anything? Uh, sure. I, well, I, first of all, I just echo everything that Anne uh, said. And uh, locally here, the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network has uh, certified uh, close, very close to 80 employers. And uh, actually, this makes, uh, this marks our largest employer in terms of sheer number of, uh, of people who work for the city of St. Catharines. Um, so you are now officially our largest um, employer. Uh, recognized as a certified living wage employer here in Niagara. And as Anne said, we hope that this is uh, just continues the, the growth of, of the, uh, the living wage uh, work across the region um, and that we continue to see more and more employers uh, signing on in the years to come. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that. And I do have um, the certificate uh, that was supplied to us that verifies this. We'll be hanging this proudly down where the public can see it as well. So a, 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 a symbol uh, for what council and, and, the, and the community and, and our staff stand for. The interesting thing, and I'll just read it again, is it says um, we are the largest municipality in Ontario to start the process. So that's pretty important. Think of the 404 municipalities. So when people say, what is St. Catharines doing to address uh, things like poverty and communities, you know, Sometimes you have to start looking in at your own and what you're providing as an employment base. And uh, this is a, a clear signal uh, that we take our roles, responsibly, our roles and responsibility as councils and as senior staff. And um, this is an opportunity for us to, to help encourage, as Anne said, other, other businesses, other municipalities to step up and uh, join, which is what is a very important uh, network and a very important uh, process as we as we've under, understood as we've gone through this so Ann and Lori thank you very much for being with us today and that pretty much closes out the mayor's report on a on a solid note and I'm going to now turn it over to the acting city clerk Kristen Sullivan and so uh, she's going to take us through the agenda and we do have some procedural things that we just need to discuss so please keep your attention attuned Thank you. So the following amendments are being made to today's agenda. For item 13.2, there's an additional reason to go into closed session. It's going to be pursuant to Municipal Act 2001, Section 239.2F, advice that is subject to solicitor-client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. We've received two. Um, we've received notice from Councillor Porter that she would like to request that Council waive the rules to consider two motions not appearing on the agenda. One is to reconsider the effective date of the municipal accommodation tax, and the other is a motion regarding support for migrant workers. In a moment, we will walk you through each of those items. Um, the motion to waive the rules and the motion to reconsider will be discussed as part of the adoption of the agenda. If the procedural steps pass, then each motion would be discussed separately later in the meeting under the motion section. Um, and there's been one item of additional correspondence that's been added to Council Sugar Sink folder, and that's a letter from the St. Catharines Hoteliers regarding the implementation of the municipal accommodation tax. So there, there are the two um, amendments or two amendments to the agenda that Councillor Porter wishes to bring forward. The first is a reconsideration of the previously decided motion regarding the implementation of the municipal accommodation tax. Councillor Porter has provided notice that she would like Council to reconsider the effective date 
um, based on our review, the best way to do that would be to reconsider the very last clause of the motion. Um, procedural steps required is step one, because this was not on the agenda, you need to suspend the rules. Um, and that would allow Councillor Porter to bring forward this reconsideration motion today instead of at the next meeting. That require, what requires a um, unanimous vote from Council. If that is approved, then Council consider, can consider the motion to reconsider um, as in accordance with your procedures that requires a two thirds vote. If that is approved, then the motion would be put on the floor under the motion section of the agenda. So that would be later on after the consent and discussion reports. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to the mayor for that item first, and then we would do the second item. Okay. So we've got the direction, and the first one is to suspend the rules, allowing 10.3 to be considered. Uh, we have uh, Councillor Porter making that motion, seconded by Councillor McPherson. Okay, so we've got on the floor. Now I'm going to ask for a roll call here, and because it needs to be unanimous, so it's just the suspension of the rules. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Krishner. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. This is only for the last clause to be this considered. Is, yes, just the last clause. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. And that's carried unanimously. So the next one is to suspend the rules related to, and uh, no, no, next one is for the reconsideration. My apologies for the reconsideration motion. So again, it's just for that last clause of the implementation date. So this is allowing the reconsideration to hit the floor. So we need two thirds majority for this. And if this passes, then it will be considered tonight on the agenda. So we need two thirds. So I'll turn it to the clerk for the vote. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Littleton? No. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, so that will then be placed in the appropriate order of the agenda. And the next one is um, related to the migrant workers. So because this motion was brought in late, it has to just have a suspension of the rules to bring it forward tonight. So again, it's a, it's a first vote to, in favor of suspending the M6.4. And this will require unanimous support in order for this to be discussed tonight. If not, it'll be on the agenda for the next meeting of council. So I'll look to, we have a mover and a uh, mover is Councilor Porter. Second, it is Councilor Miller. And I'll look to the clerk to call the question. Councilor Porter? Yes. Councilor Miller? Yes. Councilor Littleton? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Councilor Sorrento? Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Mayor Sensick? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, so this will be on the agenda under motions as well. And any other further amendments to the agenda tonight? Seeing none, I need a mover and a seconder. I'll take uh, Councillor Harris, seconded by Councillor Sorrento. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Seeing none. Adoption of the minutes from June 9th and June 13th. I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Phillips, seconded by Councillor Harris. Any amendments to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried as well. And any conflicts of interest this evening? I'm seeing no conflicts. Uh, move to the consent reports and any items lifted from consent are there any items being lifted from consent seeing none i need a mover and a seconder to 
Councillor Phillips, Councillor Miller, and I'll turn it over to the clerk for the recorded vote. Today's consent agenda includes item 6.1, report regarding the 2022 SKIP funding recommendations round one and two. Item 6.2, report regarding Niagara Symphony Orchestra line of credit extension request. Item 6.3, demolition permit for a non-contributing heritage property in the Port Dalhousie Heritage Conservation District at 3 Peel Street. Item 6.4, Update on Niagara Region Transit Commission, establishment of the Niagara Transit Commission as a Municipal Service Board, and item 6.5, Council Correspondence. So, Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Mayor Sensick? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, we do have some presentations tonight. So council chambers in all municipalities in our country represent the seat of local democracy. The many acts that govern us understand the necessity of the collective voice when this decisions are being made to grow our spaces, pass our bylaws and seek opinions into very complex issues. We recognize that the right of the majority to decide, the minority to be heard, and the public to have an opportunity to participate, and all participants to be treated with courtesy and respect. It is imperative that elected officials, citizens, and staff have input, and it is paramount that we listen to one another, question one another, but we understand that we do this in a way that never undermines any person's abilities or their dignity in chambers. So 7.1 is notice of consideration. This is for the financial management services of the 2022 community benefits. This is a public meeting, and so Gary's, uh, Gary, Gary and, uh, from Watson Associates, Scadlin, and uh, he will be presenting with Adam Smith, our manager of uh, accounting and payroll. They'll explain the proposal. Mem members of the public were provided with uh, options to submit written correspondence. No one has uh, submitted any correspondence and there has been no one listed to delegate. So staff will respond to the questions after the public meeting has been closed. So now I call upon uh, Gary Scadlin from Watson Associates, economists, and Adam Smith. So uh, Gary, I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name incorrectly, but it's just something I do. Not a problem. Well, how do you say your last name? I think how do you say Scanlon. it? Scanlon. Scanlon? Did I get it? Scanlon, yep. I'm there, okay, thank you. Appreciate it, welcome. You did it well. All right, I appreciate that. I'll turn it over to you now. <laughs> I think Adam wanted to provide some introductory um, uh, remarks. All right, Adam. <clears throat> uh, sorry, um, actually, I don't know that I had any introductory <laughs> remarks. I will uh, kind of jump in at the end just with an update on some of the um, other public consultation that we've done. Uh, but just uh, I see the the following presentation is currently on the screen. Um, we're just testing you, Adam. Just want to make sure yeah. you know we're on the right page. <laughs> there you go. All right, I think we'll turn it back over to Gary then. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a little easier to do this presentation. I think I'd be a, a loss for the other one. So it's a pre pleasure to be before council. Um, we've been working with staff and have been uh, working with um, uh, the task force uh, committee to um, review uh, a number of different elements. This is to some extent a, a new um, or a, ref uh, a refined, um, revisited uh, piece of legislation. So um, I'll take the opportunity to go through uh, what the legislation change is and then kind of go through the, the basics of the calculation and um, uh, we'll go from there. Next slide, please. So this just goes through the, the, the highlights of, um, uh, of what I'd like to cover tonight. I would note that we released a, um, a document that's called the Community Benefit Charge Strategy and that was released on June 9th and that's part of the mandatory requirements uh, prior to considering uh, passing a development, um, sorry, a community benefit charge bylaw. Next slide. And this just summarizes the process. We started the latter part of last year and uh, with staff 
and we've come through and we've met with the task force on a couple of different occasions, um, in part to provide uh, background information and to receive input uh, from all of the members, which helped to um, uh, guide us in developing the bylaw. Uh, tonight's public meeting, subsequent to this on July 18th, Council can consider uh, the elements of the bylaw. Next slide. <clears throat> and again, please. <clears throat> so in there, uh, Section 37 of the Planning Act is uh, has historically been called the community benefit charge. It historically was to impose a charge on developments that either exceeded uh, the, the average height across uh, an area of the city or for increased density. And in those particular cases, the municipality could negotiate with the developing landowner to receive additional contributions or community benefits um which could be in-kind contributions public art money dedication of extra parkland etc um if you recall there was the bill 108 process that the province took us through and that document was seeking to ch change 16 pieces of uh, existing legislation well section 37 of the planning act was one of the areas that got modified and um uh, as I say, uh, we'll go through what it's what it's done. So really what they've done, instead of imposing a charge on just certain developments that have higher density or high or greater height, they the province has looked now to impose a charge or allow municipalities to impose a charge where the development is at at least five stories or greater and contains at least 10 residential units. And if you meet that criteria, then you can impose a charge. And the charge would be 4% uh, or up to 4% of the market value of the land the day before building permit. So go from this very uh, you know, unique uh, historic piece of legislation to one now that can apply across any development that's at least five stories, minimum 10 units, and you'll pay up to 4% uh, of the land value. I say up to 4% because we have to go through a process in order to justify uh, imposing the 4%. So it could be zero, could be 1%, 2%, uh, up to at least four, but we can't go past four. This charge is allowed to be imposed by local municipalities, but not the region or for single tier municipalities such as Hamilton or Guelph or London, et cetera. So it's narrowed to local municipalities for the most part. Next slide. <clears throat> I won't go through extensive review this a little bit uh, of the schematic. This is chapter three in our report, but basically and very quickly, we look at a certain, uh, we look at a, let's say a 10 year planning horizon and within that, we take a look at those units that would uh, fit that criteria of the minimum five story and at least 10 residential units. So that's the only area we would focus in on uh, imposing a charge because that's that's what the uh, legislation limits us to. Um, the types of costs that we can recover are, um, you know, for the most part, anything that's not a development charge service can be included as part of the um, uh, the CBC funding for the CBC. Can also provide for additional parkland contributions over and above the minimum amount that you could get through your uh, parkland uh, bylaw. Um, there are certain cases where we might be able to cross into development charges, but we've left development charges out of the mix because we want to just have services under the DC are very clear and the services we're recovering under the CBC, once again, are completely clear. And we go through, uh, and I'll go through the details of how we get to the calculations, but there's a process on which we do a calculation to justify the 4%. Next slide. And again. So I've noted we've looked to isolate the growth which relates to this form of development. So we've looked out over the next 10 years. You can see the forecast is to provide for about 6,554 residential units 
over that time horizon. You can see there's uh, about 700 single and semis, there's about almost 1,800 multiples. That leaves you with in total about 4,000 or almost 4,100 apartment units. Now, not all of the apartment units are going to meet this criteria. You could get, um, you know, developments that are four stories or less. You could get additional units being built in single family homes, et cetera. So we've, we've uh, reduced that, that 4,000 figure by about 950. So we're really focused on 3,100 units that fit this criteria. And in working with planning staff, we've looked at location throughout the uh, municipality. And you can see there's been allocations of um, the, uh, the growth in different segments of the, uh, of the city. Next slide. <clears throat> Associated with those areas, we need to, as I've noted, um, the charge would be, uh, the applicable charge is up to 4% of the market value of the land the day before um, building permit. So in doing our calculations, we've looked at the units, we've looked at the areas, uh, different parts of the city, we've looked at the land values associated with it, and as we move across from left to right, you can see the areas of the city. You can see the units that we worked with uh, planning to identify what's coming through the development process. We've got uh, uh, assessment information. So we've looked at the average value of the land in that area. We've taken the units and we've divided them by the average uh, units per acre to come up with an estimate of the total acres. And then we've multiplied that by the land value to come up with uh, an estimate of the land, the value of the land on which these units will be uh, located. So if we look at all that development, the market value of the land would be worth about almost $130 million. And if we applied the last two co uh, columns there, if we applied the maximum 4%, you can see that as a revenue, the municipality would receive uh, about $5.2 million over the next 10 years if we can justify that 4%. So this is to some extent an enhanced revenue source for the municipality. Uh, and uh, it could, as I say, generate about $5.2 million for you. Next slide. And again, as I've noted, there's different services that we're allowed to include as part of the CBC. Uh, all of the non-development charge related services. So it could provide for uh, expansion of uh, municipal city hall, uh, museums, public art, heritage, uh, affordable housing, public realm improvements, planning related studies, et cetera, uh, enhanced parkland. Uh, some municipalities historically have collected under section 37, so they'd look to continue some of their past practices. So those are kind of like the, the, the different um, services that we would look to over the next 10 years, look at projects or potential expenditures. And we would take those expenditures and if we divided it by the that land value I showed you on the prior slide, the product of that, if it's 4% or more, then we can justify imposing that 4% charge. And that would allow us to collect an estimate of about $5.2 million over the next 10 years. Next slide. And just to, uh, when we're looking at projects and such, how do we kind of uh, look to what portion of those projects would be uh, apportioned to uh, this particular type of growth? And this schematic is just showing you to some extent kind of the mapping that we've used in order to allocate the cost. So if we ended up with a cost of a million dollars, let's say for a project, and this is what we've deemed like a citywide project, maybe municipal parking or something like that, then we would, if it was in the DC realm, we'd be deducting 31% for non-residential, leaving 69% for the res. So if we look on the bottom, the, of the million dollars, 690,000 would potentially be uh, attributed to the residential sector. Now, when we move to the middle columns there, you can see we need to say, okay, how much is actually gonna benefit the high density versus the low and medium density? 
And you can see that it would be 56% of the 69% would carry on in our calculations. And then when we hit the next level, not all of the high density will be uh, um, charged this particular charge. So we then take 77% of the product of the, the other two calculations. And at the end, we end up with, if we started with a million dollars, we could recover $300,000 for this particular, uh, these particular types of projects. So it's not a full funding source, but it gives you a contribution towards certain works. So this particular one would work out at 30%. And if we go to the next slide, because of a slightly different way of uh, adjusting or recognizing the non-residential versus residential, for things more of cultural related, heritage, et cetera, we could recover up to 41% of those projects. So of a million dollars, we can get funding for about uh, 410,000 towards those projects. Next slide. And again, please. So when we've looked at uh, different categories of, of uh, services, we have growth related studies, we have CBC strategies, cultural and public ground. Uh, there is a provision in there related to affordable housing, and that's for uh, housing action plan. So some municipalities, and I'll touch upon this at the end of the presentations, but some municipalities are seeking to generate some contributions towards affordable housing, but uh, those are uh, places that have already developed a, an affordability, affordable housing action strategy and have identified costs which we could consider to be funded through the CBCs. So we've provided for at least uh, contributions to consider this um, housing action plan to be funded through the CBC. And then you can see there's other, there's other infrastructure. In total, we've identified at the beginning almost $40 million of gross costs. And after we go through the deductions, uh, we end up with um, uh, a net cost of about 13.6 million and applying those different percentages, we, through this calculation, would identify the potential recovery of $5.4 million. Now, if you divide, divide that by that land value that we talked about, we've justified a percentage of 4.2%. Now, if you recall, I said that we can't go any higher. It's capped at 4%. So we've identified that we're close to, and actually a little bit in excess of the 4% um, contribution um, <clears throat> maximum. Next slide. And again, please. So if council considers the bylaw, then um, the bylaw that would be passed would allow the municipality to impose 4% on developments that hit the five-story and at least 10 residential units, like five stories and above, at least 10 residential units. And that would generate up to about 5.2 million. There are mandatory exemptions that have been provided for in the act. So basically um, buildings that don't meet that five story plus 10 units, whether it be new or redevelopment, long-term care homes and retirement homes are exempted. Colleges, universities, indigenous institutes are exempted. Most type of buildings uh, provided by the Royal Canadian Legion, not for profit housing and hospices. So those are the mandated uh, exemptions that are provided for in the legislation. We, and we would incorporate that obviously within the, the bylaw. Next slide. And one more time, please. So we've talked about affordable housing with the uh, with the committee, and I did note there are a couple of municipalities that have advanced themselves to the point that we could consider including some costs into the CBC. Um, at this particular point, um, as I've noted, uh, there's probably uh, two different aspects of affordable housing. The first is, can we take some of this money and build affordable housing units or encourage it in some way? So we've at least taken the first steps towards funding the housing, uh, uh, the affordable housing action plan. Once you complete that process, 
part of the funding eligibility can arise through that. So we'll be able to identify the works and include it within this 4% funding envelope. So it's, we're partially funding it right now until you develop a full program. So that's the one aspect is we'd be looking to use these funds so the city would look to use these funds into the future. The second part is to uh, acknowledge that there will be some private developments who will be providing for affordable housing. And um, similar to the development charge, we would look to um, outside of the CBC bylaw to provide for a grant that would be the equivalent of what they would pay under this so that you'd have a program to once again uh, reduce or remove the uh, additional cost of this bylaw onto those particular types of units that fall into whatever you deem the affordable housing exemption should provide for. So that's something staff are gonna be working with in addition to the development charge uh, grants and that'll be coming back uh, for council's consideration. And next slide. Next steps, uh, as we've noted, is um, July 18th, we would look to um, come back and have council consider the, uh, the draft bylaw that's been circulated. Um, and upon passage, then we would look to start imposing the charge. And that completes my presentation, Mr. Mayor. I think there's some conclusion uh, comments by Mr. Smith. All right, thanks. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so just, um, again, the, the community benefits charge, we're doing uh, this public meeting um, tonight. However, it's not the only um, public engagement that uh, we've completed through the process. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly kind of run through the development studies task force um, in a little bit more um, detail than what Gary touched on and uh, provide an update on the engage STC survey results um, that we have. Uh, so if I could get the next slide. Uh, so for the development studies task force, uh, as Gary noted, uh, we did um, have two meetings with them um, on May 19th um, and then again on June 15th. Um, so at both uh, meetings, there was uh, information provided to, to go over and presentations provided um, from Gary at Watson and Associates. Um, at the June 15th meeting, there was a motion passed by the task force uh, that the Development Studies Task Force endorses the staff recommendation on community be benefits charges, and that the task force uh, recommend that City Council approve the community benefits charge bylaw, uh, and also that any grants related to community benefits charges be funded in order to replenish the community benefits charge reserve. Uh, and that motion was unanimously uh, supported by the members of the Development Studies Task Force on June 15th. Uh, next slide, perfect. Um, and the other piece um, of public engagement that we've done um, is the Engage STC survey. So the community engagement survey was launched on June 10th. Um, it was open for two weeks. Um, it was um, communicated through the city webpage, posted on social media and part of a, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so it, and we did go out in a press release as well. Um, we did only get 13 uh, participants in the survey um, of residents and business owners. So uh, from those 13, 92% did in, uh, identify that they engaged occasionally or frequently in city cultural art and heritage events across the community. At 92% also uh, of participants agreed with the expansion of public realm initiatives uh, should be provided in communities where development and intensification occurs. Uh, the participants did agree that affordable housing is important and that growth should pay for growth. And 92% of participants also agreed with the collection of a 4% community benefits charge on eligible um, developments. Um, and that covers uh, my just little piece there on the public engagement. So at that point, at this point, we can uh, take any questions. All right. 
Uh, thank you to both the presenter and uh, to Mr. Smith. Uh, since we have no one delegated, I just want a motion to close the public meeting. So second, um, moved by Councillor Townsend, seconded by Councillor Garcia. And all in favor of closing the public meeting? Okay, so that public meeting is now closed. Now, just in terms of um, this next part, just asking for questions of staff, uh, not looking for any comment as to how you feel about this, because this will be deliberated on July 18th. So this, that's when the, the final. So just looking for questions and then uh, opinions and, and positions will be uh, made available July 18th. So Councillor Kushner, you're up. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first question is with respect to public engagement. Uh, the indication was that 8% were not in favor of the CBC. Who were the 8%? Were they the residents or the landowners or the business group? Uh, so through the mayor uh, to the councillor, uh, so the 8% the, the represents one of the respondents um, to the survey. Um, so I don't know exactly which um, respondent it would have been. Uh, there were some comments that were provided and I do know that there was one of the comments that just mentioned around the um, current economic state um, with increase in inflation and wondering if now was the correct time to implement um, such a charge. So my guess would be it may have been that person, but I, again, I don't have the uh, person by person results. Okay, thank you. Uh, we all agree it's attractive to have uh, an additional revenue resource, but the fact is that we often hear that high rise, high density units are being discriminated against, that they're paying more than they should, and therefore we should be lowering their rates in order to provide affordable housing. So is this not contrary to that argument? What we're saying here by charging 4% more, would we not be making the units less attractive, less affordable? Uh, so through the, the mayor, um, I'll maybe start with that. And perhaps if uh, Mr. Scanlon or Director Kate want to um, jump in and add anything to my comments, um, they are welcome to um, the the charge is a charge on the the value of land before development um, and at a level of four um, percent it's not a, a per unit charge but if you take the um, 5.2 million dollars that could be collected and you divide it over the 3,000 uh, units you you get a cost of roughly eighteen hundred dollars uh, per unit so um, we are not talking a significant cost, but it, it would be an increased um, fee that uh, would be payable uh, to the developers of those new units. Um, now, what that fee goes into paying for, um, again, is all of those community benefits. So those things that make people want to to live in the community. So um, there is there is a bit of a balance there. Um, and when it comes to affordable housing or the like what we would Kind of call the probably look at as subsidized housing um, and affordable housing we have talked about grant programs to, to offset the impacts for uh for those so uh, i don't know if uh gary or tammy you had anything you wanted to add certainly thank you and through the through the chair to the councillor the original the original uh, principle behind Section 37 community benefits was that for properties that were seeking increases in density and height, that the financial contribution would go to things in the public realm that would help offset uh, perceived impacts from that development. What we're seeing now is a transition to a new style of program where it very much separates 
development charges and community benefits and makes them more predictable for the development community up front. What we heard from the development community throughout several of our several of our development studies as we've gone along, but also in uh, previous municipalities that I've worked in, is that community benefit discussions always took place at the end of an application. So at the very start when a developer picks up a property is when they prepare their performa on how much they're going, how, how much the construction is going to cost, what their carrying costs are going to be, um, and when they anticipate on going to occupancy and receiving the their the fine their finances at certain intervals, and then it was at that point that they would suddenly be hit with the community benefits charge that they had no way of knowing how to insert into their performa. So the new program helps offset that by making it very clear at the outset to what those charges. Can can be so they can work that into their performa. So it's not necessarily that the development community hasn't been doing this or that it's a new charge. It's making it more predictable that they know what it is up front so that they can include that in their performa as part of their development. But it also goes to improvements in the city that they can use for marketability of their property and improves the greater public realm for the community at large as well as our cultural programs. So, um, at the outset, it might seem like it's it's a charge, but it's one that uh, we should have had in place a long time ago to help support our, our community moving forward. Yeah, but um, the question remains, does it not increase the cost of providing those units? And if that's the case, it makes them less affordable. Through the mayor to the councillor, Development charges for high density developments ha are reduced accordingly because they benefit from um, they benefit from not having to install as much new infrastructure. So you could say that a, a minor charge like a CBC could make a unit more unaffordable. However, the offset there is the difference between what a single or a ground oriented form of housing would pay for DC versus versus a multi-unit building. So it's, it's not necessarily an affordability issue and it's not necessarily something that would suddenly make a, a unit no longer affordable. Well, I find it interesting that uh, on the one hand, we have CIP to make uh, units more affordable and on the other hand, we would be suggesting this. Thank you. Councilor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the Director of Planning, um, uh, Ms. Kite or Mr. Scanlon. Um, the community benefits um, seem to be fairly prescribed. Um, could they be applied to, um, we, we've got to uh, reduce our carbon uh, footprint. Um, can these community benefits be in terms of environmental, uh, environmentally uh, better built units or for them to include? solar panels or green roofs or um, other other mitigation strategies, better insulated buildings, better insulated building envelopes. That's not included in this program at all, or could we stretch it to include some of those? I'm happy to answer the question, Mr. Mayor. So there are, um, if there, part of the definition is to identify um, capital related costs. We are, um, there's no real um, restrictions, so to speak, uh, but we need to, you know, make the link between uh, development and the capital related costs and then go through kind of the calculation process that we, we presented. So potentially there might be something, uh, it would have to be identified. I do know that some municipalities have sought to use, let's say, a development charge or other types of fees or charges as a mechanism to encourage some of these other things. So they they may look at um, some type of, you know, 5% reduction on a DC if you do certain things. Um, so that could be considered. Uh, but at this, at this particular point, I would probably suggest that that be part of the review or the grants program that you would consider outside of the adoption of this bylaw but you could consider these um, uh, alternative um, grants for um, initiating any of those um, uh, particular environmental related um, encouragements or inducements. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon, are you aware of any other municipalities that have done it? Have, have you CBC for that purpose? 
Well, uh, through you, uh, through the mayor, uh, right now there's only two bylaws that have been passed. Uh, everybody is over the next six weeks. There's uh, probably about another dozen or six, six, six to eight weeks. There's probably another dozen that'll be before council. Right now we only have Hamilton, uh, which was the first, and then uh, Mississauga, and they don't con contain those provisions in there. And none of the other clients that I'm working with have uh, considered those um, within the bylaw. But as I say, if outside of the bylaw, there are some additional grant programs to encourage, you know, the um, uh, those elements that they could be considered through that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other further mm -hmm. questions on this. Uh, so the motion that we have in front of us is re related to the community benefits charge, uh, that a final staff report and the CBS bylaw come back to council for any amendments on July 18th, 2022. So at that point, if there's any further questions that's, that council uh, would like clarification on between now and, and July 16th, please get in touch with Adam Smith or Director Kitse, and they'll be able to take you through uh, any additional comments or questions that you may have. So with that, I just need a motion to move the staff recommendation on the screen. Councillor Miller, Councillor Littleton, and all, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, so that's carried. And again, it wasn't a, a roll call because this is coming back to Council for the final vote on July 18th, correct? I would look to Adam Smith about what is coming back on July 18th. Okay. Um, so uh, through the mayor, what we would intend to come back on July 18th um, at this point would primarily be um, perhaps just essentially a covering report with the bylaw for approval. Um, if there's any changes or anything that comes up between now and then, it would be highlighted in the report. Um, but that would uh, be what we'd look to have come back. It's just a, a brief report identifying any changes and the bylaw. Okay. So between now and then, if there's any concerns of council, if you want to get them into Adam Smith. Okay, that's carried. All right, then the second meeting is one that's uh, being all brought together as 2023 schedule of rates and fees recommendations amendments to the 2022 rates and fees for municipal special event parking and food trucks and mobile vending carts on city-owned parks and facilities the second public meeting will combine the three items 727374 as all three reports relate to the city's rates and fees notice of consideration of the 2023 rates and fees recommendations and the amendments to the 22 rates and fees for municipal special event parking and the food trucks and mobile vendo carts have all been published in accordance with the city's notice bylaw. Public meeting will proceed as follows. Michael Patterson, process review analyst, will present regarding the 2023 schedule of rates and fees, including the other ones that I had already mentioned. Members of the public will, were provided with uh, options to submit written correspondence on any of those three items. No one sent anything in writing. Today's public meeting is held electronically and members were available to delegate. Uh, the following individuals have requested to speak, Mr. Matthew Sherman and Ms. Rachel Braithwaite, and they will be presenting after Michael Patterson does his presentation. We will then have the two public speakers, and then once the public meeting is closed, the report will be cons each report will be considered separately. So now I call on Mr. Michael Patterson, who have a PowerPoint presentation. Good evening, Mayor Senzik and members of council. This will be a short summary of the proposed changes to the 2023 schedule of rates and fees. On the next slide, I will outline the authority and rationale for fees. The legislation primarily responsible for governing rates and fees is section 391 of the Municipal Act. Rates and fees are charged for goods and services provided publicly by the City of St. Catharines. The idea for charging fees is that those who distinctly benefit from a particular good or service should be the one to pay for it. Next slide, please. Every year, 
Rates and fees are reviewed by staff using a multi-stage process. The first step in this process involves setting a starting point for an inflationary increase. Historically, this starting point has been the previous year's common core rate of inflation. While reviewing data, staff identified two unexpected patterns beginning to emerge. If I may draw your attention to the chart on this slide, I want you to focus on three particular time periods represented by the letters A, B, and C. But first, some context regarding the chart. On the horizontal axis, we have time, and on the vertical axis, we have inflation. The three lines are the three measures of core inflation used by the Bank of Canada to set monetary policy. The three measures are trim, median, and common core inflation. In terms of the time periods, if we look at section A, we see all three measures are fairly close together around 2%. This observation is what we would expect. And if we were setting our starting point for inflation for rates and fees for this time period, it would be set at 2%. The second time period I want to draw your attention to is labeled B on the chart. For this time period, the measures of inflation are starting to show a variance. This variance is expected and acceptable because each measure of core inflation uses a different methodology to calculate core inflation. The last period I want to draw your attention to is labeled C on the chart. For this time period, we see the measures of core inflation have become uncoupled and range somewhere between four and two and a half percent by the end of the time series. This range is problematic because it is significant and does not indicate a clear starting point for inflation. The second issue is that if we look more closely at the data, we see a black line trending lower in comparison to the other measures of core inflation. This black line is the common core rate of inflation and is the city's current uh, starting measure. This trend is problematic because the common core rate of inflation may not be capturing a component of inflation that the city is exposed to, energy, for example. On the next slide, we will present an alternative measure to address these issues. Next slide, please. To address the previous issues, staff is recommending we use estimated future total inflation as our starting point for rates and fees. For 2023, this value would be 3.2%. The total inflation represents the total basket of goods and services the average family purchases in Canada. The advantages of this measure include capturing the cost of energy, a cost the city is exposed to, and one which is often either excluded or mitigated by the core measures of inflation. The second advantage is future estimated inflation is forward-looking, allowing us to match the expected inflation rate with the appropriate time period. On the next slide, we will explore in detail some of the new fees being created. For 2023, Community, Recreation, and Culture Services is introducing four new fees associated with swimming. These fees are to address changes with the Red Cross and Life Saving Society program. The museum has introduced a new subscription fee and a new special event staffing fee has been created to recover costs associated with after hours special events. Next slide, please. Financial Management Services has created two administrative fees related to water and tax reminders designed to recover costs associated with managing the process, and Economic Development and Tourism Services has created a discounted fee associated with not-for-profit film permits. Next slide, please. Planning and Building Services has created a new fee associated with administrative matters related to bylaw enforcement. The fee starts at $250 and is the greater of 15% of the total cost to remedy the situation or a minimum of $250. Finally, Engineering Facilities and Environmental Services has created a new fee associated with private street name signs. On the next slide, we will review the total impact of fee changes for 2023. For 2023, staff is recommending 1,108 fees. These fees consist of the 11 new fees previously discussed, but also the removal of 23 fees, which are outlined in more detail in the report. Next slide, please. In terms of distribution, most fees are increasing between two and a half and three and a half percent, with only 2.1% of fees increasing greater than 5%. This distribution is very close to the future estimated total inflation rate of 3.2%. Next slide, please. 
In terms of revenue generation, staff estimates a little over $188,000 will be generated from existing fee increases and a little over $197,000 will be generated from new fees. When added together, total revenue should increase by approximately $385,700 in 2023. Next slide, please. In addition to the fees discussed so far, we have a few fees that may be changing in 2022, which if approved will impact the 2023 rates and fees. This information, the information presented so far does not incorporate the impact of these 2022 fee changes. The first group of fees is regarding food trucks and mobile vending carts. This fee consists of two components, a monthly fee and a prolocation fee represented as the environmental fee. Next slide, please. The next fee is regarding special event parking during large scale events. The idea with this fee is that it could be charged at the discretion of the director of financial management services or the manager of revenue. This means this fee could range between five and $20. The intent is this fee would not change for regular events such as the Ice Dogs, Niagara River Lions, or First Ontario Performing Arts Center events. Next slide, please. To summarize, staff recommends using estimated future total inflation as a starting point for rates and fees. For 2023, there will be 1,108 fees, of which most fees are increasing between 2.5% and 3.5%. Mayor Senzik and members of council, this concludes the overview of the changes to the 2023 schedule of rates and fees. If there are any specific questions regarding a particular fee, representatives from the various departments are available to comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Patterson. So we're gonna to go to the delegates first and then we'll go to the questions. So uh, the first delegate to speak is Mr. Matt Sherman, Matthew Sherman, and he will speak. And then if there's any questions of council to the delegate, you're more than welcome to ask questions. So turn it over to Mr. Sherman. Sorry, I'm just having a little trouble here figuring this out. No problem. There we go. Okay. Hi, Council. Hi, everybody. How are you guys this evening? Very good. Good to see you. Uh, you as well. Um, just going to make this short and sweet in regards to parking downtown. Um, parking downtown has been, I'd say without doubt, one of, if not the biggest challenge for my business. Um, every time there's a major event, like an Ice Dogs game or a massive event at the Pack Center, the amount of parking that's available downtown is extremely limited. Um, we had this conversation before in regards to that there was available spots in the parking garages, but it will just simply say lot full. Um, and this is when the fees are $5. Now, the concerns that I have are that whenever you raise the parking fee for an event to $20, that's more than the cost of the admission to, to, to visit my establishment. It's more than a hamburger costs at Hamburger, the restaurant. It's there's tons of businesses downtown who um, where people are patrons are using the downtown parking facilities in order to visit these downtown businesses and it's deterring business away I mean they, not only are the major events taking up um, whatever limited parking we have but you're deterring other people from coming down because at $20 it's extremely expensive now I understand this is only at city lots and it's not in all spaces but the street parking will be the first as it's free or limited or minimal cost. It'll be taken up initially. Also too, my experience is that the city events, ice dogs, games, et cetera, all happen at seven o'clock. And a lot of my, you know, my business in particular starts at eight o'clock. So by the time my patrons get there, um, there's typically no parking to begin with, you know, trying to convince somebody that 20 bucks a spot is going to be okay. Um, when it was used to be $5 for event parking, is, is a tough pill to swallow. And I, I think it's gonna sig significantly impact my business uh, in a negative way. And I feel that way. I'm, I'm actually disappointed that a lot of other people aren't here to speak today from other businesses, but um, I think it will negatively impact a lot of businesses downtown when all you're doing is trying to go for a quick bite to eat or you know, going to the gym or one of the many things that you can do downtown if uh, parking is $20, even if it's only sometimes, it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's typically on the evenings and weekends, which is, which is when a lot of these businesses are, have their um, best operating hours. That's basically all I wanted to say. 
Okay, we got some questions. We got, uh, thank you, Mr. Sherman. I got Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Mr. Sherman, for being here tonight. And uh, Look forward to your upcoming lineup. You do have a stellar lineup coming up at the Showtime Comedy. My question is to you as a longtime business owner downtown, um, what, is, what is your vision and strategy? What, what would you like to see done with parking downtown? Uh, you've been downtown for a long time and I'd be curious to hear kind of what your idea is with you know, a solution for parking. For sure, I appreciate that. I mean. I have a lot of opinions. I don't think I can answer all those opinions in, in, in a quick question. But I mean, I, I've always been an advocate that we don't have enough. Um, the argument is, is that we we have we believe that parking in for the downtown core is a lot bigger or or a lot further, let's call it, than where people are willing to park. People will not come to my establishment and park 12 blocks away or 15 blocks away. They just won't do it. They will literally call us and say, I couldn't find a parking spot. Please refund my money and drive home. Um, they're not willing to park on York Street, even though that's maybe considered or, or like, you know, past Montebello Park. They will not consider that as an option. Um, I understand that they may take training or years, but um, charging them $20 isn't going to work either. So, I mean, for one thing, I'd like to see the bylaw removed in the city of St. Catharines. It says you cannot tear a building down to create parking. Um, that would actually increase, increase the service parking. I think a lot of properties don't have much going on or there's a lot of vacancies that we could increase the amount of surface parking in the downtown core. Um, I'd also like to see, you know, what's the, I don't know. I'd like to see the parking be more accessible, uh, more, maybe, maybe more drop off and loading zones for Ubers and cabs. Um, I'd like to see maybe um, a shuttle service or some kind of other thing that can bring when you have thousands of people coming down for the ice dogs game or something to that effect, maybe some, community shuttle service or something where you park at the Penn Center or you park at another place and people get shuttled in and so you don't have to use thousands of dollars or cost each person 20 bucks a head, 20 bucks a car. Um, I think there's alternative things that we can do to, you know, off the top of my head, you know, these are just some suggestions I thought of. Yeah, I like the suggestions and thank you for that. Um, I like the transit uh, suggestion as well where maybe if we, you know, there's um, something we can do where if they come down to see a show, they take free transit, similar to what we're doing with the beaches. But um, yeah, lots of ideas, things to consider, and appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing any further, uh, Councillor Porter? I guess, uh, thank you, Mr. Sherman. I believe we have a free transit initiative with the ice dogs still going, do we not? Yeah, I'm not sure if you knew about that, Mr. Sherman, but um, if you have an ice dogs ticket, you can hop on the bus and go to the Meridian Center. I just wanted, what's that? There, maybe we could expand it to the River Lions, so. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, seeing no other further questions, thank you very much, Mr. Sherman, for your delegation, very much appreciated. And thank you, to, thank you for sharing your perspective. Thanks now, no problem, you too. We now head on to uh, Miss Rachel Braithwaite, and she'll be presenting, and she is the Executive Director of the Downtown Business Association. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I am going to echo a little bit of what Matt just said um, and add a few other pieces. So first of all, I do want to thank the staff for sharing this report publicly. Um, and I do understand the sensitivity around time for this. Um, I do wish there was more consultation. Um, I literally found out about it midweek um, and quickly emailed my members to say, hey, guys, this is happening. Please have your say. Um, it would be lovely if there was better communication, just so that we do have the ability to consult the members who are really impacted by that. This, which is our downtown businesses, this is only impacting our downtown. Um, so it could have been a really quick reach out to them. So um, that's just my one, two cents about the communication piece. Um, you know, the other piece is as this is only downtown that is impacting and as Matt clearly I identified, this will have a huge impact on our downtown businesses who are all still in recovery mode big time. Um, you know, if you're going retail shopping, you're not going to go and park for $20 to go look at something that you might want to purchase. 
Um, so it really, you know, hinders the success rate of our businesses. A lot of our businesses may end up closing on event days, which will not be really the nicest perception that people coming for events to our city will want to have. Um, we will look like a very closed city. Um, so I do have a number of huge concerns with regards to the impact this will have on, on our members big time. Um, and, you know, talking about solutions, one of the solutions, you know, I did bring this up with the Ontario Business Improvement Area Association, and there's not too many BIAs actually that do have this, this charge, these event fees, obviously Toronto. Um, Guelph was another one, um, and one um, suggestion that they had was that it's built into the ticket price. So it really only impacts those going to the event. So for example, if you're gonna go see Elton John at the Meridian Center, then maybe there's a, a few dollars added to your ticket price that everybody pays, and then parking is included with that. Then our small businesses can still say, hey, we have free parking. Because the other challenge that we have with this, not knowing what the price may be, not knowing when the event may be, because there really is no matrix for that, is how do we communicate that? So we've been really plugging our marketing to say, hey, come shop downtown, park for free and shop downtown and support our local businesses so the money can stay in our economy. We can't say that anymore. You know, the, this whole summer we have downtown promenade and our big plug has been park for free and come explore downtown. But we can't say that at all this summer because there's events on every single Saturday. So now we've got to change our marketing and say, hey, there's event parking almost every weekend. So pay $5, I think, to come and park and, and explore downtown. That's a much harder sell. Um, so just some things for, for us to keep in mind on that piece. Um, just to go back on communication too, is you know our, our businesses can communicate with their patrons through social. We can communicate with our members. But if we don't know until three days ahead of time when event parking is going to be or how much it's going to be, that is a really tough sell and we're going to get a lot of angry people um, calling not just my office but i'm sure also many of you to to complain about how much parking is in the downtown because they won't know about it and that is a huge huge hindrance for bringing people to our downtown which is just starting to rehab happen again after covid i really don't want to push them away um, i understand like i said the sensitivity and the the reason for wanting to to get as much funding from you know huge events like born and raised and i do support that but i just don't want it to be done on the backs of my businesses okay thank you very much miss braithwaite any questions uh, and <clears throat> i think we'll um as we go go to staff there should be some clarification because i don't think it's every weekend that you're going to have the dynamic pricing. So I want to be very clear with staff then and to the public that this is not a every weekend thing and it's going to be very limited. Um, so I don't want there to be any public confusion. Uh, Councillor Miller, you got a question of Ms. Braithwaite. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks for the presentation. I'm just um, curious in terms of uh, the downtown businesses, is there, has there been a study or uh, ever done about how much of the traffic is coming from from people who drive and, and park? Um, because I know elsewhere there's a lot of benefit to um, stores have seen benefit from people accessing the site through better transit, through better bike lanes, through walking. So is there has there ever been sort of a breakdown? Because I know the feeling is always free parking is better for business. I'm just wondering if we've ever really found that out for sure. Um, good question, Councillor Miller. I do appreciate that. To be honest, I do not have those results. Um, it would be interesting if parking would be able to pick that up through, you know, the Honk app and other resources like that to see if it is able to investigate where those people are coming from um, and if there is an increase through that through events. Um, I will say I would love to see more people coming to our downtown through walking and biking and transit because that is the future. But I will say our downtown is not very accessible by bike, um, which does hinder a lot of people from biking into the downtown. Um, also, there's limitations on bike parking. So, um, you know, if, the, if there's a way to balance it, and maybe that's one way that we support a local community to still be able to come downtown at, affordably through increased um, accessibility for bike routes and bike parking, then I would love that for sure. 
Yeah, and I, I, I certainly appreciate, um, you know, the, the consternation or the concern that the business community has. I, I'm just, uh, I wonder if there could be marketing, as you mentioned, or advocacy around that, and, and I think it might help the political will to improve bike access, improve public transit access, and it might sort of assuage maybe some of these concerns, but that, I suppose, is uh, maybe a little more long-term solution, but I think the more people we can get coming into the core on transit, the better for sure. So that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kushner, question to the delegation. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You mentioned uh, that the parking fee could be built into the ticket price. You indicated that a couple of other communities have done that. How effective has that been? So the feedback that I received, and I believe it was Guelph that have done this, is that it's very impactful. So it allows businesses to still promote come and park downtown for free and shop at my business for free but the city still gets the revenue and in fact sometimes gets more revenue because not everybody buy everybody uh, parks to go to events but it allows for example say a thousand people are going to Meridi I mean that wouldn't indicate a higher event ticket price but say a hundred thousand people are going I know it wouldn't hold that many but I can't do math in smaller numbers um so maybe you charge two dollars on every ticket price. We know that we're not going to get every hundred thousand people to park downtown, but it's it it makes it even across the board. I think something very similar is happening with Cirque du Soleil. I believe their ticket price is built or their parking price, forgive me, is built into their ticket price, and as a result, they have access to the Ontario parking garage. So I think it it is very feasible for us to do it. The challenge will be having the event organizers agree to it. But I think if we as, as a city, we have the, the leeway to request for that, right? Okay. But thank you. And I hope our staff will consider that as a possibility and report back at uh, the public meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kushner. Councillor Garcia. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to you, to Ms. Braithwaite. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I certainly appreciate your concerns about the, <clears throat> the impact on the businesses downtown. My question for clarification is <clears throat> your point about uh, uh, lack of communication. Um, were you aware that this presentation and this potential rates and so on were presented to council and discussed with us uh, at the last council meeting? I will be honest with you. I do not track each council meeting. So no, I was not. So I was made aware of it. I had a meeting with city staff um, just last week, midweek, um, who are fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I am not making any digs at city staff. They are wonderful to work with. Um, but they brought it to my uh, knowledge at that point. So that was, I believe, on Wednesday or Tuesday. Um, and so immediately I sent notification out to my members right after. But I was not notified uh, through the public meeting. I just, unfortunately, I don't have the ability to track each council meeting. Okay, thank you for that. I'm, I'm amazed it didn't get out there in a hurry because I said we had a discussion and I had some questions or how it would work and so on. So thank you. Councillor Phillips. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the speaker. Um, would you, as in your role, be okay if the $5 fee was left the way it is for events? Good question. <laughs> uh, that's a tricky one. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, it's not something I have polled my members on. I know that I do get a lot of complaints from my members with regards to the $5 fee, um, especially in certain lots. They seem to be more contentious than others. Um, so the, the feedback I always get with regards to the $5 fee um, is a surprise, is that I didn't know it was event parking or the you know, they can usually just park there and come pull in and pick up something because that's all they were doing, but the staff wouldn't let them. So it's more the, the lack of flexibility and it's the surprise piece that really I find frustrates my businesses that I think could be worked around, right? With better communication and education and awareness. Um, so it, it, it's not that we're saying free parking 
24 seven. I think my businesses get that that is not necessarily feasible. Um, so they're, I think they're willing to meet middle ground, if, if you know what I mean. It's just they want to make sure that their their customers are not going to be scared away by 20 potential $20 event parking, right? That's that's the concern I think my members have is right now we're not notified when event parking happens. It's a surprise. And I if that model goes with $20 parking, our businesses are really not going to survive that. I appreciate that for sure. Um, obviously, you're aware we have a parking reserve fund that has been depleted almost, and uh, that $5 goes towards providing uh, enhanced parking facilities so that drivers can get into the parking garages and, and uh, staff are paid for or whatever. So obviously, that's we, we, had, we did have a, at the time of, of the uh, Performing Arts Center and the Meridian Center opening, uh, when we brought that $5 fee, and there was quite a discussion as to whether we would have that or not, but that's why that happened. And uh, um, uh, personally, I think that's a good fee, but uh, the $20 one I do have concerns with. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Phillips. Um, seeing no other further questions, I just have a, a quick question to Ms. Braithwaite. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and you're aware that this dynamic pricing would not apply to Niagara Ice Dogs, Niagara River Lines, other events at the Meridian Center, events at the First Ontario Performing Arts Center. So you're very much aware that this is something that will be used very, very infrequently. Are you, are you aware of that? Yes, yes. Although I do, I mean, like Grape and Wine and those other events that are fairly frequently, you know, every year, um, I think would still have this apply to it, I believe. So looking for clarification from staff on that, uh, whether or not that would be applicable or things like Ribfest, which is another thing that's happened regularly. Any staff have a, a comment on that one? Just through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to uh, to Council and to Ms. Braithwaite, with regards to the dynamic pricing, it gives the flexibility for staff to look at the events that are happening at um, Montebello Park. So an event such as the Grape and Wine and Rib Fest, we would look at charging um, the special event fee of, of $5, but not the upper limit of um, $20. Um, um, the upper limit of the $25 $20 is, um, has been identified as just that, the upper limit, and when there are a significant number of events happening on the same event uh, or the same weekend time frame. Um, when it comes to parking, it's a, it's a supply and demand issue also. Um, there is not enough parking in the downtown to um, accommodate um, all of the patrons that want to come to the various events. So therefore staff, um, we're looking at um, some solutions as to try and you know, perhaps change um, individual behavior, um, such as carpooling, using ride share, um, also um, just um, for the, the public's information for the event that is occurring um, at the, um, the Live Nation event at Montebello Park, there has been a, a shuttle service arranged as well, that there is parking um, over um, off of uh, Low Street and there, the transit will be running a shuttle service to the downtown. So this is the first time we've uh, done that item. So staff are looking, you know, this is the, the first time we're looking at this type of um, change in, you know, parking. And it's the first time we've had these number of events in our, our downtown area as well. Um, I also take this opportunity to respond to with regards to um, including the ticket pricing um, in uh, for parking in the uh, event cost, um, with regards to Cirque uh, du Soleil, we the pricing of parking isn't included. What was requested is that there was a parking location identified, so that has been identified as the Ontario Street parking garage, and to direct. Um, patrons to the Cirque du Soleil event to that particular um, parking um, location. Okay, so I just, uh, to Ms. Braithwaite, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Director Douglas. Just wanted to make sure, so it doesn't also include Ribfest and Grape and Wine. So 
your comment about communication and the need for communication between businesses and the community is important, uh, but I think what we've just been able to demonstrate here is it's not going to be a tool that's going to be used frequently. This will be an infrequently used tool to help manage uh, parking and change people's habits when it comes to large scale events. So just wanted that to be clear and I don't see any further questions of uh, for the presenter. So we're gonna move on now uh, to closing the public meeting. Thank you very much, Ms. Braithwaite for being here. And we're gonna close the public meeting on all three and then we'll, we can have individual discussions on each report. So mover to close the public meeting. I got Councillor Phillips, seconded by Councillor McPherson and all in favor of the closing. And that's carried. And now we will have the motion. And um, the motion is we're gonna start with 7.2, uh, which is the rates and fees report. So this is the rates and fees report that was recommended by the Budget Standing Committee. So the Budget Standing Committee has already reviewed this rates and fees. The fees created outside the annual rate and fee process be added to next year's rates and fees schedules without a minimum inflation and that the starting inflation rate for all city fees be changed from the historical common core of inflation to the future estimated total rate of inflation calculated by the city's bank, Scotiabank and that the city clerk be directed to maintain the list of rates and fees for public inspection in the legal and clerk services department. So it's in front of us right now. So this is the first one. So we'll start with questions. Councillor Harris. Yeah, I guess my question would be to the director of finance and this has to do with parking. I'm just wondering with the special event parking, why exactly do we have a uh, staff staffing in the certain so uh, councillor well I, I, yes i think you're we're, we're not on that one that's 7.3 that's the so we've got three different reports that we're going through so the first one is okay. just the rates and fees for 2023 so it's we're not doing the um, municipal event parking that's 7.3 that's the next one okay i guess it kind of goes hand in hand with but okay go ahead <laughs> Oh, no, not really. We're just uh, we're going to do the rates and fees, and then we're going to go to that one. So that's a standalone one. Um, so, any questions on this one? So I know the budget chair uh, has has gone through this one. I don't see any questions. Um, I will say that I at the um, budget committee I did speak against the um, the the tax and the water fee, the five dollar fees that were being ascribed to both those. I didn't feel that those were appropriate. So I'm, I would like to um, make an amendment that those two either be removed or I'll just vote uh, against that piece. But um, that's one area where I did not agree that there would be an additional fee added to the um, water and tax late fee notices of $5. So that's an, uh, an amendment. On the floor is Councilor Littleton, you're moving this because it's the budget item. Yeah, so I think maybe the director of finance can explain that just for viewers who might be watching. Thank you uh, through the mayor to the councillor. The uh, $5 um, fee that's being recommended um, for tax and water notices, that is for uh, tax and water notices that we send out for when a tax or water account is not paid by the um, by the due date of the particular bill. When we looked at, um, we had brought this forward in 2022 um, and we um, had been asked to remove it or it wasn't approved at the time. So we brought it back again in 2023. Um, we have also looked at our comparator municipalities and five of our 10 comparators do have this fee and it does range from uh, $5 for three of those comparators and $10 for um, two of those comparators. So. Um, staff do believe, um, you know, using the model of um, a user pay um, when we're sending out reminder notices, it is particular to those um, account holders that um, are receiving the reminder notices. So it is a reasonable fee to um, be um, to be recommending for uh, council's consideration. Okay. So I don't want to make an amendment. I'm just going to ask for that to be separate, voted on separately. The addition of the tax for the the fee for both taxes and water and i'll just vote against that separately any other comments to this one okay 
So we'll start with the uh, the fee for the water and the tax one. Is that so we'll get that one through, and then we'll do the remainder of the motion. Okay. Yeah. So just to confirm for the council coordinator that it's the late reminder fee for water and, and taxes. Tax. Yeah. Five dollars. Perfect. So that would not be included in the rates and fees. Yes. Sorry, some clarification, Mr. Mayor. So if we vote yes, that means that you're taking the fees out, and if we vote no, the fees stay. I'll look to the clerk. And that is correct. That's the way it is written, that it would not be included. So you would vote yes if you do not want it to be included. Councillor Miller. Uh, no. Councillor McPherson. No. Councillor Littleton. No. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Dodge. We're voting on number two, right? Yes, the highlighted one. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Sensick? Yes. And that's carried. Okay. So then when on the remainder of the any further clarifications? Okay, seeing yes, please, none. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, oh, sorry, Councillor Williamson, I didn't see your hand. Yep, you're, you're up. No, that, that's okay, thank you. Uh, I, I just went through you to staff. In terms of the, this inflation uh, rate calculation, is that in line with other municipalities? To the mayor, through the councillor, um, there isn't really a, a standard across municipalities what uh, is used with regards to calculating um, the inflation rate for uh, rates and fees. Um, it depends on what their um, policies and procedures uh, indicate. Um, staff is recommending using a more forward looking um, inflation uh, rate and um, with the recommendation of using the, the city's current bank, if, if we change our financial institution, that gives us the flexibility with regards to this policy. Um, just for council, we did, um, you know, have a look at the inflation rates that are um, forecasted for our um, financial institutions, everything from uh, Desjardins, Central One, as well as um, Bank of Montreal, CIBC, Toronto, uh, Dominion and Royal Bank. And there's a range of 1.9 to 4% uh, with an estimated average of 3.04% is what is currently being forecasted for um, 2023 total inflation. So the recommendation in this year of the 3.2% is um, in line with the average of what is um, being um, forecasted for all of uh, the various financial institutions. Okay, thank you, Director Douglas. All right. Um, yeah, I guess we can vote on this one. I got, oh, sorry, Councillor Sorrento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just thinking about something, one item that I uh, came across in the, in the rates and fees and through you, Mr. Mayor, to Director Kate or Director Douglas, I noticed and I was taken aback that I think the fees for an application for a condo was something around $14,000 um, or or to convert, there, there was a fee, it was 14,000 well, through you, Mr. Mayor, to any one of the directors, either Director Kate or Director, um, Director Douglas. Um, I was just wondering why that was so expensive. There was a, a, a list of uh, condo fees and they ranged, I think, from like $1,700 to like 14,000. Maybe you can just help me out with that and some clarification on that as to why it's so expensive. Through the chair to the counselor, the Planning and Building Services Department is currently undertaking a comprehensive fee review study. And as such, the rates and fees for 2023 as currently proposed in the document in front of you this evening uh, basically reflect uh, the fees that have been in place for the last several 
years with inflationary increase, knowing that we will be bringing to council, council consideration, a document later on this year. So the fee that you see there, councillor, has been something that's been in place for, for a few years now. Uh, what um, we're misunderstanding may be is that we very seldomly do plan of condominiums and we only do a plan of condominium when a, a site plan application has site plan application has not been done so for most instances as part of our um, process improvements that we took that took place several years ago i want to say about three years ago now uh, we had included an exemption for plans of condominium where another application has taken place that also includes a public component so as long as we've gone through either a, a zoning bylaw amendment or a site plan amendment or something where we have already undertaken an extensive review then we when um when an applicant wants to put a plan of condo on it, they go through an exemption process so that we're not performing a redundant process. So the fee that's there now reflects um, our, our what our competitors and comparators charge, and it represents the amount of work that goes into one of those. That being said, for the development community, they seldomly uh, take that opportunity to undertake that application because we're taking care of the same types of review through other application types. Thank you, thank you very much, Director. I was just really surprised at uh, kind of, I don't wanna say hidden fees, but the amount that uh, is charged to an investor or an applicant. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Sorrento. Um, seeing no other further, then we're gonna go to a vote and it'll be a recorded vote from the clerk. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Sensick? Right. Yes. Thank you. And and that's be carried. Councillor Littleton, and I'll be right back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We are now at item 7.3. Can I get a councilor to move the recommendation in municipal if special events parking and associated rates reports? Councilor Miller, I have a seconder. Councilor Sorrento, thank you. Okay, does anyone have any questions or comments? Councilor McPherson. Um, through you to staff. Um, the, it seems the communication piece has been the, is the really big concern that everyone is having and, and I know that downtown businesses are having. Is there a way that we can include, uh, obviously not in this motion, but or in some way that communications are, uh, you know, when there will be a special event fee, it will be more than, you know, a few days notice? Because I know the downtown association is really working to get people to take transit, ride buses, or, you know, ride their bikes, but there are still lots of people who want to drive cars, so it will give them, giving them as much opportunity as possible to shape their message and encourage people to take alternate forms of transportation when there are the larger special event fees. Thanks. That was it. Uh, okay, the question, is that a question to the director? Would you like to hear? Sure, yes, okay. please. So I'll go to the <laughs> director of finance, please. Thank you, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, with regards to the communication, um, staff did um, come forward at the June uh, 13th meeting to try and get the, the message um, out to some of them. Um, I have noted the comments um, from the Downtown um, Business Association and staff will work to um, in, ensure that we're in Proving our communication with the Downtown Business Association. Um, you know, previously when we had um, the special events in place just for events at the Meridian Center and the first Performing Arts Center when there was a function happening at the Partridge Hall, um, that, you know, that was 
you know, our, our procedure. Now with, if this um, moves forward um, after council's deliberation this evening, staff will um, revise our, you know, internal procedures and we will ensure that there is improved communication and so that we can work with the downtown business association and so that they are providing, uh, we're providing as much notice to them to provide to um, their business memberships. Council McPherson. Thank you. That's all. Yep. Okay, I'm, I have a list here. So I'm gonna go to Councillor Harris next. I guess my question is more an operational question. I guess it would be for the director of finance. I'm just wondering why, if we have parking pay and display machines, we actually have attendance in some of the parking lots for the special events collecting $5. Because so I know for myself, I typically don't carry any cash. And I would think it would be a little bit easier just using a machine and putting a $5 ticket in the window. Uh, through you, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, with regards to the um, the uh, special event charging um, at the various machines, um, some of the machines um, we need to upgrade their technology so that they have the functionality. Um, we also have been working with our um, mobile um, parking provider um, so that we can have that um, functionality um, with a, a tap feature um, and staff if um, this goes forward and we're going to be expanding the special events we are going to be looking at other um, functionalities that we can in introduce at the um, various lots um, to provide a, um, a cashless um, tap solution um, as well so the machines that are in those lots aren't capable of collecting five dollars through uh, you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor, it's with regards to the, the programming um, technology that uh, was, is within the mach machines. And um, at this time, certain machines, um, we don't have the, the capability, but as we're moving through updating our um, meters downtown and our pay and display machines, we will be looking at that functionality as well. So I guess my next question is, what is the actual cost of having live attendance as compared to reprogramming the machines? Through uh, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor to um, the councillor, we, when we run special um, event parking, currently the process is, is that we have um, guards uh, stationed at the various um, lots as, uh, and they are there um, uh, from the hours of when we start special event parking at, at 5 until approximately um, 8 p.m. Um, so it'd be three hours for the various lots. Um, I would have to um, look at the, the rate that uh, we're currently uh, being charged from our supplier of that to uh, give you the uh, exact uh, quote. Um, I'm not sure if our director of EFES um, would be able to assist with regards to any comments with regards to um, the machine costs um, and that uh, functionality is I don't have that uh, cost in front of me either this evening. Yeah, that's you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, the, the machines that we currently have in place do not have the functionality to be able to be reprogrammed to allow us to have flexible uh, rates. Uh, that we can charge uh, if there's significant programming that goes into them that we just don't have that functionality in place. I don't have, uh, it's something that we would have to get back to you with, uh, with regards to what the cost to retrofit those machines are versus what we pay uh, to have attendance uh, um, at the various garages. I believe uh, it's only at the two garages that we have the attendance uh, for, for the events. And a couple parking lots like Garden Park parking lot things like that and i guess i well i i would actually like to see some sort of report on how many lots we actually have attendance what's the cost what's the uh uh what kind of measures we have in place for slippage and that kind of stuff and how we actually account for what how much money is received so i don't know if we could put that in as a direction and maybe uh i don't know who would take the lead on it maybe the cdao david oaks i don't yeah. know I'm just going to ask the CAO, can we get a memo or something from staff about that? Um, through you, uh, Madam Chair, we, we can certainly put a memo together with that. Um, we did have uh, 
in the Budget Standing Committee report a recommendation to do a full parking system review. Um, we'll most likely bring that recommendation back in front uh, of Council in the next several months, to, which would do is exactly what uh, has been requested amongst other things. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Council, are you finished? I'm finished. Okay, thank you. Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a number of questions that I submitted earlier to uh, Ms. Reed, and she replied and answered them. Uh, but I have a couple of more questions through you to the Director of Finance, I guess. Uh, one of them is, um, in response to Ms. Braithwaite, um, we said that uh, there is a couple of municipalities that include the uh, uh, the parking fee and the ticket price, but I'm wondering, do we know if other other municipalities charge dynamic pricing and charge as much as twenty dollars for event parking? Um, through you, Madam Chair, to um, the councillor with regards to the dynamic um, pricing, um, just. Um, with regards to what other municipalities um, charge, um, there is a, a bit of um, a range um, out there. Um, I know uh, uh, larger centers obviously charge, um, you know, over the over the twenty dollars. Um, and with regards to um, including the um, tickets um, in the ticket price, I. Um, had indicated that um, that wasn't something that we um, have done um, with regards to the um, uh, the specialty event parking um, price. I think um, if council wanted, we could look into that, but there are some logistical challenges with regards to ensuring that there's adequately parked parking reserved um, as I had indicated we do have some challenges with um, mm -hmm. the amount of parking that um, is available and when you sell um, include uh, parking in a ticket price there is the expectation that that um, spot will be available um, for um, those particular patrons to utilize that spot when they've included in their ticket price thank you for that uh... And to you, Madam Chair, to the director again, um, I was also concerned when it says that it is the uh, uh, at the discretion or uh, delegated authority to the director to decide when to charge dynamic pricing. Uh, could that put you in a difficult position where uh, where you can be blamed, uh, lack of objectivity, whatever? Are we better off to have a if we were going to do that, have a specific guideline so that uh, everybody knows when there's going to be dynamic pricing. To you, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor, to the councillor, with regards to the dynamic pricing, um, as I had um, indicated, it would not, they would be one off events and they would be infrequent um, events where there would be multiple events occurring um, in the. Uh, downtown um, at Montebello Park as well as the Meridian Center is when you know the um, higher end of the the pricing for special event parking would be utilized with regards to you know the other um, uh, the sliding scale with dynamic pricing um, permits um, utilization like currently our process is for an event such as the ice dogs game we would ha we have um, special event um, in effect for the Ontario um, parking garage as well as the Carlisle parking garage the garden uh, park lot the David S house lot the Ray Street lot and head street when we have um, the River Lions games, we would only have the Ontario Street parking garage, the David S. Um, house lot. When there's an event at the First Ontario Performing Arts Centre, Partridge Hall, um, only it's the Carlisle parking garage, the Garden Park um, parking lot, Ray Street lot, Head Street lot. Um, so what we would do would be something similar. There would be parameters based on where the event is located, the number of attendees expected to attend the event, and those would be the, um, the procedures that staff would put, put in place uh, as to when um, the various um, pricing would be implemented for the dynamic pricing. 
Okay, uh, thank you for that explanation, detailed explanation. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just concerned that our our businesses downtown are just in recovering from a lengthy pandemic. So I would like to make an amendment when appropriate that uh, at least for the remainder of this year, we keep the event fee at the $5. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so, uh, Councillor Kushner, and then we got uh, Councillor yes. Phillips. I think you're, you're ready. Okay, Councillor Kushner, you're up. Yeah, the, the, the question I have, uh, Mr. Mayor, given that this is uh, of concern to the business community downtown and certainly a legitimate concern, would this be reviewed in one year? Would the special event parking fee be reviewed in one year if it's adopted through you mr mayor to the councillor um yes um staff would be bringing back um information um at the um, end of the year um as we bring back our reserve positions and we would indicate um the amount that uh, was collected and the the cost of the special event parking and so that if council wanted to um look at the special event parking and this dynamic pricing model and its success and whether or not they wanted to make changes, then uh, they could do it at that time, but that would be a reasonable expectation. Okay, and my next question is, uh, why was this not considered to be a phased in period? For example, go from $5 to $10 and then to $20 a year after, after one year review. So councillor, um, if, if I can, just be reminded that this isn't a, it's a um, dynamic pricing. So right. the $5 will stay for 90% right. of the events and there may be $20 for major events. It could be $10, it's depending on what the staff decides. So it's not scaling up to 20. 20 is the max for a large, large scale event that would happen maybe one once or twice a year. Okay. The, uh... The, the impact on the business community would still be quite significant for that uh, one or two events. So my question is, uh, uh, as uh, one of the other councillors has indicated, we don't have guidelines, do we, for staff to make an interpretation? So perhaps they could start off with a maximum fee of $10 for 2023. Give staff more guidance. Okay. Would that work? No, that's something that I think we could put on the table. Okay, so I'd like to put. <clears throat> I'd like to put that on the table then. Okay, so we've got uh, both yourself and Councillor Garcia. They're going to look for some modifications. Let's continue to go through the speakers list, and we'll get to Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to Ms. Douglas, I, I, the mayor might have asked answer this already. Uh, but based on, on your research, how often would you see the maximum be applied in a year based on, on past history? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, um, it would be very infrequent. I would estimate that 90% of the special event parking would be at the $5 uh, current um, rate and that the other 10% of the time we would see um, something um, in the dynamic pricing range. And what would determine, like, in time, and I, I like Councillor Kushner's amendment, but in time, what would determine whether, you know, when you go from $10 to $20, for example, have you decided on what that scale would be? Through the mayor to the councillor, we would be looking at implementing a um, the higher end of $20 when there would be an event at both, um, uh, the, a ticketed event at both Montebello Park and at the um, Meridian Center, um, because that would bring um, approximately 20,000 uh, ticket holders into the downtown. And that would be um, when we would be using the, the higher end. And then it would be a scale from then comparing to what we currently have now. And then that we would determine the other, um, the five, the 10 or the, the $20 based on that. So you'd base it on on expected attendance then as to how much how much the fee would be that's yeah through you mr mayor to uh the councillor that's correct 
and being on the Grape and Wine Festival Board, I'm very pleased to hear that it's not going to apply to us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Councillor Townsend? I guess my question, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, is just um, will those days be communicated? I know it's difficult to, you know, foresee that because you have concerts coming to Meridian Center, kind of, you know, different dates and whatnot. But will this be communicated to the public by staff so that they, they know when local residents come downtown, they're not shocked by the $20 fee? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, yes, we currently have, um, there is an events calendar that um, is available to the, the public and that uh, does indicate when special event parking is in effect. Um, so we will be continuing to um, update that um, with regards to the special event parking and any changes in the rates. And we will also work with our communications team as well as ensuring that the information is shared with the Downtown Business Association. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more thing, I would just, through the mayor, just uh, a recommendation would be to maybe reach out to some of the businesses that do also sell tickets, like the the comedy, uh, uh, the comedy business, uh, the comedy uh, club downtown, uh, and any other maybe types of restaurants to encourage them to encourage their patrons to maybe if they show the reservation or a ticket to a show that they can get complimentary transit to come downtown. Uh, just an idea for there. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Townsend. Uh, seeing no other further questions on this, uh, we just do have a couple of amendments um, and we'll go to Councillor Garcia. So the mover and a seconder for this coming out of the, uh, need a mover and a seconder to move this. Um, so get on the floor, Councillor Porter, Councillor Phillips, so it's on the floor. And <clears throat> Councillor Garcia, you just, you've got a couple of, of changes you wanna make? No, you got on mute. Sorry, just to one, Mr. Mayor, I would like to uh, move that uh, the special events be, be held at the $5 uh, for this year and that uh, dynamic pricing be considered uh, following this year. So I believe, is that contrary to the motion? So it is contrary to the motion, so you'd have to, We'd have to vote this down, Councillor, and then uh, you'd bring in and keep the events, um, special events fee at $5, because that's what it's currently set at right now. And yeah, Councillor, we can vote against Clause 6, and that would keep it at $5. $5. So we don't have to make an amendment. We'd, if Councillors want to vote against Clause number 6, then that would keep it at $5. Okay, okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kushner? Yes, yeah, so my amendment, Mr. Mayor, would be to uh, have the range from uh, five to a maximum of $10. Okay, five to a maximum of 10. Uh, so it's an amendment to the amount. And that yes. is, um, I'm looking to the move in a seconder. I don't believe it is friendly. If it is friendly, we can let it stand on the floor. Councillor Porter? If not, then we could, we'll just vote on it as, a, as an amendment. Would that, would that start in 2021? That would, then that would be? It would start immediately. So it would start with this upcoming weekend. It would be friendly if it uh, went up to 20 next year. And there would be some notice and um, consultation. If uh, Councillor Garcia would, Council or sorry, Kushner. Councillor Kushner, if uh, you would consider the implementation for this year to be 10 and um, then it provides some time for the $20 next year. Yeah, the, the question I have to staff is uh, can we um, uh, make that type of decision for a new council? Actually, we're doing it now anyway, Councillor, in terms of whatever we approve today under the rates and fees, that would be binding for the next term of council. So the answer would be yes. Okay, I, I would change that a bit in that the $20 fee be considered uh, after one year. So for the 2023 rates and fees? Yes. Right, okay. so leave that portion there and Correct. then the one above, we just be doing this year a $10. Yes. Um, that's, yes. That would be friendly to me. I don't, who's the seconder on this one? Councillor Phillips. You're the seconder on it? Yeah. Okay. So in clause six, 
The maximum goes to $10 as directed by Councillor Kushner. Uh, the rates and fees will be set at 20 and it will be reported back to Council as to the uh, effectiveness of the rates and fees changes. In addition, uh, guidance. And so that's what we've heard, guidance. So better clarification around guidance would be coming forward as well. Councillor Kushner, I believe you asked for that as well. Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. All right, so I don't think any emotions are being pulled out separately. I'm seeing everything being left Can I hear some clarification, please? Yeah. I'm trying to understand why you decided regarding my motion. So you're saying we would have to vote that uh, clause six down? Yes, if you want to keep it at five, you have to vote clause six down. And you can okay. separate, if you want to do a split the motion and pull that one out now, Councillor, you can do that and we can vote on that yes. one. You'd yes, like to do so that? I'd like to split that out so that we keep it at $5, please. Okay, so the only way it would be kept at five is if we defeat this first vote and the vote is going to be highlighted. And then we know what we're voting on. And so it's that one right there. Thank you to the council coordinator. And so that one is the one we're voting on right now. And I'll look to the clerk to call a question. So this is on clause six for the 2022 rates and fees to a maximum of $10. Councillor Garcia. Yes, yes, meaning that we vote, sorry, I'm confused. Uh, now. Yes means you're in favor of yeah, the motion. You'll be voting this down, so it'd be no. Oh, so I, I'm saying no, yes. <laughs> We're gonna count that as a no. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. Okay. And um, for the remainder of the motion, we'll do that. That's everything else that's there and the bottom part there. Okay, turn it over to the clerk. <clears throat> yep, it's for next year. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Sorry, just for clarification, the highlighted part that says the minimum special events parking fee during major events be set at $5. Does that stay in there still or is that out? That stays, it's for next year's rates and fees, which we'll come back for with a staff report as well. Okay, thank you, yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Krishner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes, to be discussed at the time. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Mayor Sensick. Yes. And that's carried. And the unique thing, hopefully, this starts a discussion about carpooling and ride sharing and taking um, taking transit or, or taxis to events downtown because uh, the real issue with this subject matter is that we actually don't have enough parking to facilitate 16,000 people coming into the downtown for different events and we're not gonna knock down buildings and put up parking lots. It's not what I think I've heard from city council or staff for at least the last 15 years. And also, Mr. Mayor, alcohol is also a concern as far as ride sharing for 23,000 people. Right. So. So it's a great idea to start, and I hope that's what this discussion will be about uh, with councillors talking with the community is that when these larger scale events coming in, ride sharing and transit are great modes of transportation to get people more comfortable with those um, ways of, of coming into our downtown and hopefully over time transit and ride sharing and, um, and taxis will, will continue to be a, a mode of transportation rather than always just driving 
in a car with one other person taking up a parking spot. So um, looking forward to the discussion that comes forward out of this. 7.4 is the fees and food trucks and mobile vending carts. And again, this is a an amendment to bylaw 2021. It's rates and fees for 2022. And it's about the inclusion of environmental fee and increase the mobile vending cart permit monthly fee. So this has been described as per the presentation. Are there any questions on this one? Councillor Phillips? Just a short one. Uh, probably, I'm not sure whether our CAO will answer this or he can direct it to whomever. As far as a food truck going to a site, if they get a license, are they going to that site for the year or is a, um, are we gonna be able to move one food truck? I'll use Sunset Beach as an example. Do you, is one food truck going there for a couple of weeks and then another one can go in so they get a variety or is that person going to be there for a period of time? That might have been in the report and I forgot. Okay, Doctor, I mean, Director Christie. He's not a doctor. Director Christie. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I need a doctor. I have a cough, so sorry. Um, <clears throat> through you to the councillor, um, the intent of the permit is to have a food truck <clears throat> Um, pay a monthly fee um, for the entire season. So the intent right now is to have them um, stay at, at one particular location because what they're paying for is exclusivity, for example, for Sunset Beach. Okay, thank you. I hope we get a good one. All right, thank you, Councillor. Seeing no other further questions, uh, Councillor Littleton. Apologies, I actually have a question. And I'm just wondering if there's a way that we could better have better words. It's this hawkers and peddlers license. I'm just wondering if there's like, it's probably something that's a little outdated. I, I don't know. I wonder if we could go for more like an entrepreneur's license, like just something. It just sounds. But it may be a you know what I mean? <laughs> there may be a delegation at AMO. I, th I think the province has to change, change that title. <laughs> yeah, it just struck me as being a little awkward. I thought they were peddling hawks, but. Okay, direction to staff is to look at what the 21st century's um, descriptions are for people who peddle food, wares, and trucks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, look to the clerk for, the, and we need a mover and a seconder. Who wants to be the hawk and peddler? Councillor Phillips, Councillor Littleton. All right. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? A hawkish, yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Miller? A mawkish, yes. Mayor Sandvik? I'm peddling this for a yes. All right. That's carried. Now, we don't have any um, presentations, but we do have a discussion report. We only have one, 9.1. And again, this is a request of council and um, it's the, uh, the acting city clerk, Sullivan, will provide some opening comments. It's regarding public appointment policies, committees, boards, and external bodies as it relates to councillors. And um, a, if there's an appointment by a, of a resident to a board, so it's really granular. It's not all, we're not ta talking about all ABCs, talking about councillors' appointments, and that's the way I read it. It is the appointments by councillors yes. of public members. Yes. Yes. There you go. But not the appointment of councillors. No. Okay. No. So the report in front of you today presents a new public appointments policy, which would be the overarching guiding document for the recruitment and appointment of public members to the city's advisory committees and task forces and boards. Prior to the redevelopment of this policy, staff met with the accessibility advisory committee and the draft policy was shared with the other three equity seeking committees for comment. This policy builds upon improvements we've implemented over the past four years and includes a more comprehensive approach to determine eligibility and evaluate applications, including incorporating both qualifications in terms of skills and experience, as well as selection objectives intended to create bodies with diverse representation. 
The draft also provides, um, sorry, the report also provides a draft sample of application and evaluation forms that could be used for advisory committees and task forces. It is similar to what we use today, however, it is quite expanded. Um, these are not for approval by council. We're just providing them for reference only. Staff regularly make updates to these documents to incorporate feedback from the community, changes in language and terminology, and adjust any specific requirements we may be seeking for recruitment. If the policy is approved, our next steps will be to review the existing committee structure and the terms of reference for each advisory committee and task force. As part of this, we'll be looking to identify an appropriate, appropriate nominating panel for each body. We'll then report back at the start of the next term of council. And after that, staff will begin the recruitment process for the 2022 to 2026 term of council. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Sullivan, and any questions of staff? I want to thank council, uh, the staff for putting this together. Um, there has been a lot of work being done trying to make sure that we have balanced and uh, committees that are reflective of our community as well. And I think this is a step in, in that direction. Uh, Councillor Garcia, I guess you have a question? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, to you, to the uh, clerk, um, uh, just one question. Uh, thank you for that, all that work. Um, when you say that vacancies that occur within the last six months of the term will not be filled, which makes sense, <clears throat> but will there be a probation or would you have the authority to override that if that vacancy will affect quorum? So through the chair, in accordance with our um, simplified procedures for advisory committees and task forces, vacancies do not count towards quorum. The only reason I could foresee stepping into the last six months would be if there's so many vacancies that it actually impacts the functioning of the advisory committee or task force. Um, but otherwise, our simplified procedures, knowing that we are dealing with volunteers and there's a greater amount of turnover, we do um, adjust for that in our simplified procedures. I'm sorry, but it, <clears throat> couldn't you have a situation where you have a committee with uh, five people, let's say, and and one um, one resigns or leaves, and um, and then you need if you have four left, you actually need three for quorum. Or and that is correct. So we would consider that the in the in that situation, we would consider that the committee has a co composition of four members, and quorum would be three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to the acting clerk. Um, does does our policy reflect what other municipalities are doing? This isn't a, a deviation of any way in any way from what other municipalities do to um, select members of the public to their boards and committees, agencies. So through the chair, I would not say that this is reflective of the average municipality. I would say it is above and beyond that. This is more similar to what leaders are doing in places like Toronto, Mississauga, Guelph, Markham, and Ottawa. Oh, very glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, Councillor Porter, and then go to the vote. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the um, clerk, this is really excellent and what I envisioned. My only question, um, relates to conflict of interest. In, I know in some municipalities they exclude uh, family members from sitting on boards and committees, but in, in your case, or in this case, um, this needs to be disclosed in the application process and then it would be up to the committee. Can you like walk us through how would you determine if something's really a conflict of interest or not? Through the chair. So as we've proposed it in the appointment process, it is requesting that applicants declare any known conflicts ahead of time. So it really does come down to, it, be, we, it allows the committee and council when they're making those appointments to decide is this relationship or is the conflict a barrier from them being a fulsome contributor to that advisory committee or board? Um, it isn't in many situations, but in sometimes it could. So it allows kind of counsel be to be nimble to respond to the specific conflicts that are coming forward and the appointment. 
Okay, thank you very much. I guess I do have one more question. Um, it in the first part it says um, we, that people must be a Canadian citizen. Yet despite that, um, people who aren't citizens but res reside in St. Catharines who are also eligible to be members of advisory committees and task forces would this like let's say somebody who is a refugee or um, an in landed immigrant um, wanted to sit on an advisory committee, would that depend on the terms of reference of each specific advisory committee or we would, would we allow um, you know, people without maybe a certain type of immigration status to sit on committees? So through the chair, where that language comes from is through the Municipal Act. So how we've made the divide in the policy is on whether or not the body they're being appointed to is advisory or if they have like a delegated authority to make decisions. So if they're being appointed to a board that will make decisions on behalf of basically an extension of council, then they would need to satisfy the same eligibility requirements as currently, which is you need to be eligible to be a member of council. However, knowing that our advisory committees are a really important tool to reach our community and for council to hear from the community, we didn't, there's no need to be as restrictive and we thought we can open that up. So they would be eligible to sit on task forces and advisory committees, which is also a really great way to start their experience with municipal government. Okay, that's excellent. Um, I'm really impressed with this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Townsend and Councillor Miller. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Through you to, uh, to our, I guess, our uh, clerk. Uh, my question, I'm just concerned with the, the language around 2.5 and 2.7, more specifically in 2.5, where it says, Council may remove any member of a committee task force or local board at any time and for any reason. We be more specific that a reason has to, I mean, it says for any reason, it's just um, obviously it's in regards to maybe behavioral, it just seems very, a little bit vague, the any reason. So through the chair that does, it is reflective of what council's current authority is with advisory committees. Um, you, you would have that authority now. Um, you, uh, we always say you do not know exactly what situation's gonna come up. And I would be hesitant to put something in this policy that would restrict council's authority to ensure that the appropriate people are sitting on boards that are contributing to the benefit of the municipality. Thank you. Councilor Miller. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, thanks definitely to the clerk's office and staff for working on this and also to the, um, the equity committees, I think, when this council established those four years ago, this, these were the types of things we were hoping they could provide some lived experience and insight in, and I, I really think this is gonna make a big difference. So thank you to all those who are on those uh, committees. As Council Report said, this is quite excellent, so thank you. Well said, Councillor, and I'll look to the clerk to call the question. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Uh, Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes, and I think we need a mover and a seconder. I was distracted by the report on that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I think Councillor Porter was the one who brought this issue forward. Councillor Miller seconded it. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge. Councillor Dodge. I'm sorry, yes. And Mayor Sensick. Yes. And that's carried. All right, thank you very much. Again, echoing the comments of council, thank you very much to the clerk's office and the acting clerk for the work that went into this and looking forward to seeing the results in the next term of council on the committees, boards and external bodies. Okay, so we have motions and first one is 10.1. It's on the screen uh, to give a very brief preamble. I'll ask Councillor Porter who's bringing this forward. And there is a, a request to staff to pursue funding opportunities. So Councillor Porter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It is on the screen. I grappled with how to word this because I wanted to make it really big and then I talked to staff and they wanted also to make it achievable and my major focus was to have us as a municipality or through 
our utility to look at um, green energy, green technologies, and um, I was also really interested in district energy, and I was afraid to bring a big motion on that because I didn't think that I would get any buy-in, and then I ended up talking to our CAO who said, I tried to bring that forward 10 years ago <laughs> with uh, the um, building of the Meridian Center and with the Performing Arts Center we could have had a district energy area in the downtown which could have supported future growth and I died inside when I heard that uh, <laughs> because I didn't even bring I was even afraid to bring this forward it was like, oh, everybody's gonna shoot this down it seems like it's too big um, so really this is about wanting us to not miss opportunities I don't know how else to word this but you know, sometimes I guess when we look at projects like green or um, district energy, for example, the numbers financially might not work immediately, but I think that we need to be measuring these um, initiatives, taking some risks. And if we had something like a district energy area in the downtown, it's something that the new condos could have taken advantage of. We could have been part of the Electra initiative that they just presented at one of the last meetings where they're doing a pilot project on um, district energy. And so this is really about using work that's going to be done anyway, the conservation and demand management plan, which is gonna be reviewed in 2024, and having this, whatever the staff come up with, whether it's the same consultant or another consultant at the same time, um, do feasibility studies on new technologies. So when we're doing this work, we actually identify um, projects that can and should get done and then we, that we plan for them at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any comments on this motion? Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I strongly, strongly support this. After the conference that uh, you and I attended and uh, heard about the climate change projects and the impact uh, that climate change is having on the Great Lakes, this is something, anything that we can get will be greatly appreciated and uh, we can't do it fast enough, that's for sure. Thank you. Well said, Councillor. Okay, uh, with that, I'll look to the clerk to call a question. Councillor Porter? Yes. Seconder, seconder. Is it Miller time? Yes, sir. Okay, Councillor Miller. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, Councillor Porter, you're back up. This is uh, for the uh, amendment that you'd like to make to the effective start date. Um, yes, thank you. So, uh, Councillor Littleton and I have been, we're, we're pushing the municipal accommodations tax and to staff's credit, we had to do a lot of work around Airbnbs to make sure they were licensed and included before implementing something like this. And we wanted it ahead of the Canada Summer Games to staff's credit, they did that, but it honestly didn't leave a lot of time for the, our local um, hotels to implement it, and we kind of hit them with it right before the Canada Summer Games in a busy season. So there has been a request to defer um, to January, but just in talking through this and with an election coming up and um, wanting to make sure that this gets implemented. I think a fair date uh, to push this forward is to October 1st. It passes the busy season. And um, from what I understand of the municipal accommodations tax, we can't use it until we collect it for a year. And we do have some um, future events coming up. So we don't, we don't wanna wait too long to start collecting this. And I think October 1st is a reasonable time. It's the start of a, a fiscal quarter. And um, I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues will accommodate this request uh, from the hotel owners. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Need a seconder on this, um, Councillor Phillips. Okay, so it's an amendment to the effective start date. Um, I got Councillor Garcia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to uh, 
say that uh, I certainly uh, was concerned about that um, that effective date, and I raised some concerns when this came up about uh, how difficult would it be to implement. So um, I have read the letter from the hoteliers, and I think they make a good point that uh, they have to uh, to set up different software and systems and so on, and it takes time. Uh, I certainly support deferring it, um, um, and October 1st might be okay. I would like to ask to you two questions of the Director of Economic Development. Uh, number one, uh, is the bylaw written in such a way that uh, it will definitely not affect uh, contracts that were already pre-written and guaranteed for somebody to stay at at a certain hotel, for example, um, at a late at a date after this is implemented. Yeah, through, you, Mayor, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, the draft bylaw as written um, is for booked business beyond the implementation date. So it would be disingenuous to um, retroactively um, uh, tax business that's already been booked. Okay, thank you for that. And, and through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Director, uh, in your opinion, would October 1st, which is uh, August, September, so it's two months later, would that give the uh, hotels enough time, in your opinion? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I would uh, reflect on the letter that I received a copy of. They requested a January start date. Uh, I haven't heard otherwise that uh, an earlier start date um, would be amenable. Mm. To you, Mr. Mayor, I do support uh, delaying it, but uh, if the October 1st date uh, fails, I would like to make an amendment then that uh, that it be uh, January 1st, as the hoteliers have requested. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harris. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm just wondering, maybe the clerk can answer this. If we defer this to October, are there any sort of, like, are we a lame duck council? Can we approve it then? And then the second part of the question, I just want to know from the uh, the presenter, why exactly is October 1st the drop dead date? Because to me, I would think a calendar year would be more appropriate. So uh, for the first question in terms of October, it's not for a council dis dis uh, decision in October that the decision is making today. So we're not in lame duck today. So that's the implementation date. And as to the second one, I'll go to Council Porter. Uh, thank you. This is a really important uh, initiative that's going to help us bring in money so that tax, tax dollars um, from property taxes aren't being used in trying to secure um, the huge sporting events that we're trying to try to this region to fill the hotels, which has been the case. And um, we can't spend the money uh, for a year. So we wanna be collecting it sooner rather than later. And I do think um, having several months uh, window to implement it after a busy season, after grape and wine um, is, is actually quite reasonable and it is before an election um, so it can't be used as an election issue because nobody knows what the mat tax is it sounds like council's trying to tax people and let's overturn it and these are some of the potential silly issues that could become election issues that um, can wind people up because nobody likes taxes um, and so this just gets puts that to bed and it's, it's getting implemented and it's getting decided today. Um, and uh, it's, it, you know, it, I think it'll make it a little bit more difficult to try and open it up. Um, so I have some concerns uh, about that. And I just, I wanna say one last thing when looking, there's been a lot of talk about Niagara Falls and being competitive. If you look at some of the hotels in Niagara Falls um, in, uh, in certain areas, they charge a 14 to $15 daily fee the $2 municipal accommodations tax, which has been uh, some of the concern here, but many of them also charge a 7.9% daily levy that pays their BIA fee. And in one case, in one hotel, it says it, it contributes to the Scotiabank Convention Center. So this, this is a, I just wanna say to the public and whoever's listening, this is a transparent, 
tax that we can implement under the Municipal Act and we will know where all the money goes and it will be a benefit to the community and a benefit uh, to tourism, sports tourism, and ultimately we wanna fill all those hotels. Thank you. No, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I'm just wondering, like I don't think it's an election issue I, by waiting another two months, like we're still approving it tonight for, and you would say January 1st and it's a new calendar year. Is the fear of having it in October because you don't want a new council to try and overturn it? But if we approve it, then it would be a reconsideration, would it not? I'll look to the clerk because I believe the answer is no. Councillor Harris, can you repeat the question? Well, I understand uh, what Councillor Porter is saying. I'm just like, I don't really see it as an election issue. All we're doing is saying January 1st. And to my thinking, starting a fresh calendar year gives all the uh, the hotels chance uh, chance to implement all their uh, software and let everybody know what they're about to do. So I, I don't know why there's pushback for October 1st. I don't think it would be an election issue. Like me personally, I just, so I'm not sure what the fear is. Can I respond to this? Can I? Sure, you can respond to it. I can hear you whispering. <laughs> this is a technical question. It's about the reconsideration. The new term of council can make any choice they decide if they want to overturn a bylaw, it's not a reconsideration. That is correct. The there new term go. of council is not held to any decisions of this term of council. There you go. Okay, so then my next question is, if we vote on this and we vote this down, can we actually vote in principle that it will come into, like, do we have to vote down the October 1st and then put a new motion on the floor for January 1st? So through the chair, if today you were to vote on a motion that the bylaw will be effective October 1st or January 1st, staff will prepare a bylaw with that effective date. No, I, my question is more an operational type thing. If we vote this clause down, then we put a new motion on with January 1st. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kushner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with uh, Councillor Harris that uh, there's no reason to be concerned about this because uh, it's an election year. I think we have to do what's right. And uh, in my opinion, the hotel industry has come through a very difficult period with COVID as, uh, as all the uh, service industries. And uh, I would think to give them an extra two months from October the 1st to January the 1st would be uh, the proper procedure. And therefore, I would support the suggestion by Councillor Harris. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Littleton. Respectfully, I think it could very well. I think Councillor Porter's um, concerns are well-founded. I think respectfully, some people who have already put their names forward are already talking about pushing the date back as it is. I think that we had the we had the discussion about this. The municipal accommodation tax is going to be a valid tax to create more incentives actually for our tourism partners. That's what the money is going to go towards. So any arguments about you know tourism industry has been hurt, hoteliers have been hurt are valid, but this is going to help them. This tax People think in our community that this is a tax that's gonna be put on the tax bill. No, it's a condemnation tax for folks that are coming here. And I think we've already discussed that it is paid all over the province. This is a very, very a thing people are familiar with. I know I recently went to London, I put it on social media, I paid $9.47 or whatever it was in a mat tax. It's just the way it is. I think that we we have heard the hoteliers. This amendment that Councillor Porter has brought forward is that middle ground to try and help them get their systems in order, although I cannot understand how in this day and age pushing a button takes three months, but maybe it does. So there we go, October 1st, let's move on with this. And for those people who are running again, let's not put any pressure on anyone running that they might have to make, you know, repeal this. Thank you. Okay, so we've had- Mr. Mr. Mayor, clarification, please. Okay, I'm gonna, if it's an opinion or anything like that, then I'm gonna cut you off. Well, just, just clarification from the clerk. I'm trying to understand since I brought up first the fact that we should stick with the January 1st that the hoteliers have asked for, 
would that not be an amendment that would be we would vote on first before the October first? No, because you didn't. The motion being brought forward from Councillor Porter was October first. You would then try and change the motion, which you're not allowed to do, because the mover of the motion has established October first as the date. So if that's defeated, Councillor, then you could put another date on the floor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll look to the question. I'll look to the clerk to call the question, Mr. Mayor. Just a clarification. So, if this does get defeated, then another motion comes on to January, January next year. Thank you. Councillor Littleton. Can I suggest yes. we just vote on the October first first, like break it into two separate things? We're, that's what we're voting on right now, October first. Okay, 1st. just October first. That's it. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. No. Councillor Miller. No. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Dodge. No. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Sorrento. Oh, sorry, you said you. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson. No. Mayor Senzik. Yes. And that's lost. Okay, so Councillor uh, Garcia, you had the floor. You want to move it to another date? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to move it to the date that the hoteliers requested, which, as Councillor Harris said, I don't think is uh, a huge deal. It's only a couple of months, and it coincides with most people's uh, fiscal year. So to January 1st, 2023. Okay. So okay. just on that motion, there's no comment um, in terms of there's nothing else being changed. It's just a date. Can, Can I look just to the clarification then? So this would mean none of the money from this could be spent to help the tourism industry till 2024? Correct. So maybe a point of clarification there. So when we pitched the mat to council, uh, we, we, um, we explained that our, our intent here was to create a new destination marketing organization. In creating that organization, we estimated what a budget could be uh, to carry that organization. The opinion is that we need a full year of collection to establish that budget, hence the need uh, to carry an entire year. Um, look, the bylaw could allow for, uh, we could start rolling funding towards marketing or events halfway through a year. It's really dependent upon what the outcome of that DMO discussion with the town of Lincoln is and whether we join and have a concerted effort so funding could roll mid-year funding could roll mid-quarter it's it's really up to staff to uh go back and determine a best path forward in the in the um bylaw that we bring bring back to council yeah i'm just i'm a bit confused why we're even talking about this we had a good plan uh but it is what it is Call the question. So this is on a January 1st. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Littleton. No. Councillor McPherson. No. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Miller? No. Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. Okay, so hopefully this maintains itself in the next term of council. Um, I'm looking forward now to what would be the third of the trifecta for Councillor Porter. <laughs> and you've got the support for migrant workers. Sorry, I feel like I got a lot in the go tonight. I apologize. Um, <laughs> this, I, I, I uh, want to thank my colleagues for allowing this to go on the floor because we tendered our active transportation master plan recently and a consultant has been hired and is going to start work imminently. And then at the night of the last council meeting, um, Furman Sanchez Soto, who worked on a farm at 7th, Street 
um, as everybody's probably well aware right now, got hit um, by a car walking on the side of the road with his two friends. One of them had, um, one of them had uh, a tire deflated, and um, it's the second death of a migrant worker in the last three years. And although this happened on a regional road, and the last death um, by it was a woman named Zaneda in a on a road in Niagara in the Lake, uh, it ha also happened on a regional road. Um, I, I really don't think we've done enough. I do take some responsibility for that. I was on a transportation committee. Um, and I think back to all of the, the things that I didn't say or the initiatives that I didn't push um, on that committee. Um, we didn't have a ton of meetings, but um, we didn't really bring this up. Traditionally, it seems like uh, cycling was uh, promoted by tourism uh, groups in Niagara. They put out some cycling map and that seemed to be the focus, but I really think we need to start changing our focus on um, active transportation to um, the local residents and vulnerable road users who we typically don't <coughs> consult uh, in any of these matters. So this motion um, really asks us as a council to support staff and the consultant in uh, making sure migrant workers are consulted in our active transportation master plan and that we ask the region to do the same thing going forward and other local tier municipalities and that we send um, this motion to other counties that have higher populations um, of migrant workers and uh, we need to figure out ways of engagement and that might include reaching out to migrant worker advocacy organizations, um, translation, recognizing the fact that uh, they don't sometimes feel like they're part of the community or they might feel, uh, they're sometimes afraid to speak out on any issue uh, for fear of reprimand so that all of those issues be recognized. And the good thing I wanna point out is that the consultant who we've appointed or hired, WSP, the project manager is currently working in Essex County on a project where he is consulting with migrant workers, I think probably for the first time, and we'll have some of that most recent experience. And I would like for this to not just be a one-off, that we start to think um, about consulting migrant workers as a practice. Uh, they live in this community for eight months, and even though maybe the majority of migrant workers don't live here, some do, they work here, and they travel through all of our city and regional roads and uh, need to be consulted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Councillor Sorrento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just looking at some of the wording here. So I'm definitely gonna support this motion, definitely the spirit of it. And so where we are requesting that the region pass a similar resolution. Now, is that wording through you to the clerk uh, or to legal or to one of the directors. I guess maybe those, I'll start with the clerk. Um, are we allowed to request that or does that need to be wordsmith or maybe through through you, Mr. Mayor, to the CAO or whomever, either, either or? Through the chair, we regularly receive motion, motions from other municipalities, whatever they've recommended and they request that we endorse it. We have an option to endorse, receive, pass our own motion. Um, they can use whatever's in the correspondence to make their decision. Perfect, and I don't know, uh, I'll just speak this very, very quickly, and I know that there are people that also live here, newcomers, that go and work on the farms. Uh, so not just migrant workers, but some people that actually live here in the community that may need this as, uh, as employment, and, and in some cases even bring their children out uh, during the day as has been the case in the past many, many years ago. So um, I'm definitely, definitely gonna support this. And I, and I would just say this, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know how my colleague respectfully takes the blame for something that happened. And I, and I hope that, that you wouldn't, uh, you know, it was horrific and my condolences to, to, um, to the family and to all the people that were involved in that. But um, I think this is a great start to address it, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, kudos to the, Mover, Councillor Porter, it's a, it's a great motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sorensen. You're gonna second the motion? Be my privilege, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Miller. 
Yeah, just uh, I had a question. Um, about a year, over, I think, a year ago, around the start of the pandemic, we had asked for um, what we could do, in particular, to reach this community. We're talking about different languages available at City Hall and things like that. I'm just curious if that's really gotten anywhere, if we've looked at expanding our language services. Um, I think we did. And because um, I remember we briefly talked about a council to the clerk's office. Um, through the chair um, at our service counter I know we have an option it's basically like dial a translator and there's a number of different languages and we can even bring them up on an iPad and they can do a video call right. um, so we do have that service I don't remember when it was implemented but it was a couple years ago okay and I know I remember Council Porter I believe actually brought up being a, a migrant worker friendly city in terms of being able to access city services regardless of citizenship status or resident um, status are we can we touch on what I guess what we have done in the in the intervening time in the last year and a half since we sort of had these discussions in terms of working in particular with this community um, through you, Mr. Mayor I, I don't have any specifics in, in front of me but I can definitely bring that back to uh, to council um, in the next day or so through our um, manager of diversity equity and inclusion because i do believe there have been initiatives okay yeah and i'll definitely um like i think we had a meeting and i, I think i have a summary of it so i'll share that with you and and, and uh, but yes yeah, certainly happy to support thanks house reporter for bringing forward thank you councillor councillor uh williamson you're up uh thank you mr mayor this uh, certainly was a very tragic occurrence all all three of them that happened with migrant workers uh, and uh this is uh, something I definitely support. It's fairly wide ranging, and I think there's lots of other aspects uh, of this. It's a, it's a complicated issue. Um, and I think the, uh, the farmers and the greenhouse operators and the people that uh, uh, give residence to these people also have a role to play in this. And um, of course, there's, there's newer technologies, including strobe lights and, and other kinds of reflective material. Um, that are available and and sometimes i see people out there riding without helmets on and some basic safety gear so i think there's there's lots to this um i think we could split hairs and, and look for all kinds of things but i think the intent is is good so i'm definitely supportive um and to the mover council supporter i guess you you could you do your homework you've done your homework on this talk to staff and and um is there anything else that we can do here to uh to address this? I, um, I, I think this is not going to be easy, to be honest, uh, so I'm not sure. Um, I don't think it's been done before. I don't think there's a lot of precedence of um, consulting, having municipalities really consult with migrant workers. So um, I, I think that hopefully WSP is quite a large firm that does a lot of transportation um, consulting with other, I mean, lots of other municipalities. So the fact that they're doing two uh, projects and consulting migrant workers with both of them um, is is great. And uh, I I just feel like pushing the region is really important. I, I that's what I would say. Um, when I looked at the region has an active transportation subcommittee. I looked through their agendas and minutes, and I don't think they met since 2020. Um, and I actually find that kind of shameful when you think about um, all of the other initiatives in, in other cities related to active transportation. So that's all I would say is making sure we always consult with uh, vulnerable road users, equity seeking groups and migrant workers and we just have to turn this into a good practice. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do agree. I, I do think there is some responsibility on behalf of um, the, the businesses that uh, uh, avail themselves of the uh, um, migrant workers um, laborers as well. So I, I don't know if we need to roll that in, in there or staff knows will know enough to uh, also include them in this process. Thank you. Right, thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Garcia, final comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is an excellent trust and uh, um, but as Councillor Williamson said, it's a very complex issue and it involves a lot of stakeholders. So I would like to refer it to the next meeting and get some feedback from staff on how we can involve 
what stakeholders in which way and any recommendations they have to make this as effective as possible. Okay, so there's no debate on referral, but uh, the counselor has put a lot of work into this with staff, so I don't think it would be a exercise very well undertaken, but I'll ask a vote of referral. Who would like to ref refer this? Put up your hand. Okay, just one person that's defeated. Uh, so let's move on. And Councillor Garcia, no further questions? No, that's okay. I, I support this period, as I said. That's okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, turn it over to the clerk to have a roll call vote. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. And Mayor Sensick. Yes. And that's care. Okay, so we now have a call for notice of motion, which is also non-debatable, so it's not like we're going to have a discussion here tonight. Councillor Kushner, do you have a notice of motion? Yes, uh, we did send it in, Mr. Mayor. The notice of motion is by Matt Harris and myself, and it concerns a request by three residents in the South End to buy a piece of property from the city. And the city uh, has indicated to them that the property is not for sale because it's parkland and also it's Greenbelt. Uh, shall I read the notice of motion? And this would not be discussed until July. Yep, yeah, read the notice of motion. Okay, so it's uh, regarding uh, the request by 66A, B, and C, Marsdale to acquire city lands behind their property be accepted in order to align their backyards with the adjacent neighboring backyards, and furthermore, be it resolved that the proceeds be allocated to the parkland fund for future parkland acquisition. Okay, so that's for council. Again, encourage council to, to do a drive-by around there. Um, that'll be for the next meeting of council. Uh, minutes and task force. The um, council receive and file the minutes of the advisory committees of council and that they be uh, received and filed. So I need a motion. Councillor uh, Townsend, seconded by Councillor McPherson. And all in favor, show of hands. Uh, that's carried. And then we are going to in camera. And I, I believe two matters or three? You said that there was an amendment on the agenda at the beginning. Two matters. It's just adding an additional reason to go in for the second item. Perfect. Okay. Do you want to take us through the so official reading of going into camera? The motion to go in cl into closed session is for item number one, property matter, lease, realty file number 85-027, lease for 85 Church Street and 26 Raymond Street, Closed pursuant to the Municipal Act Section 239-2C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And report number two is update on Niagara Region Transit Commission, establishment of the Niagara Transit Commission as a municipal service board, closed session pursuant to Municipal Act Section 239-2D, labor relations or employee negotiations, and F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. By attending the closed session, each member acknowledges that their obligations under the code of conduct, including responsibilities related to the confidentiality of closed session materials and discussion, remain the same as if they were physically present at the meeting. This includes that members are not permitted to record the proceedings and must ensure that no other person can see or hear any of the confidential deliberations taking place. Mover in a second to go on camera. Councilor Miller, Councilor McPherson, all in favor? Carried. And the council court.
Okay, welcome back to uh, the session of council. We just came out of closed. Uh, we had two files that we were discussing. One was uh, a property management file and uh, motion on the floor is coming from Councillor Littleton, seconded by Councillor Phillips. And this is the direction from staff containing the report and that the solicitor provide the necessary documents. I'll look to the clerk to call a question. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Councillor Williamson? There. Councillor Williamson, you're there. Thumbs up. I'll go back to him. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor McPherson? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's approved. Okay. Second one is related to the Niagara Transit uh, Regional Transit Commission, establishing the Niagara Transit Commission as a service board for the municipality. Seconded, uh, moved by Miller, seconded by Councillor Garcia, and that is to approve the uh, staff. Point of order, Mr. Mayor, is, is seconded by me, Councillor Sorrento. Ma Madam Sorrento. Oh, I, th I thought it was, uh, I, okay, I wrote down, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. And I wasn't mixing things up, because I was actually, I was looking at the screen, so I apologize. Apologies. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Okay, um, so we have the staff recommendation that was on the floor. And turn the over to clerks. Call a question. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor McPherson. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Sensick? Yes. That's carried. Okay, bylaws. The motion, the bylaws be listed on Council Agenda A through H and save and accept D. Be read a first time considered and passed. They be signed and executed by the mayor and, and the clerk. I need a mover for this. Uh, Councillor Townsend, second by Councillor Phillips. And show of hands. All in favor? And anyone opposed? Good. And then a, um, the following bylaws, uh, A and B, be read a first time, consider and pass. This is A and B, and it's the renewal that we just talked about. I need a mover and a seconder for A and B, and I'm going to have a, an addition by the clerk. We do have to read these out because these are not do not a show on the agenda. So because they're coming out of uh, closed session, we do have to call them out. And we have an additional one tonight for C. Oh, right, 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 because they were discussed in camera. A bylaw to authorize recreational land use master license agreement with Ontario Power Generation with respect to the use and maintenance of lands known as the valley and bed of the 12 Mile Creek. And that was in council closed session May 30th. And that the council authorize a lease renewal agreement with Folk Arts Council St. Catharines. One reading with respect to property known as 85 Church in the parking lot 26 Raymond be considered in and um, at this closed session of the 27th of 2022. And do you have an additional one? Yes, so we have a third additional bylaw that's um, to reflect the $10 maximum that council discussed tonight. So that's a, a bylaw to amend the bylaw to number 2021-101 entitled the bylaw to impose certain rates and fees charged by the Corporation of the City of St. Catharines with respect to certain administrative matters, one reading with respect to special event parking, and it was considered by council on June 27, 2022 through item number 7.3. Okay, mover and a seconder for this last piece of business. McPherson, Councillor McPherson, Councillor Townsend, and all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, that's carried. And we have the final work of business. I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the acting city clerk, uh, Ms. Doug, uh, Ms., Ms. Sullivan, for all the great work, to the council coordinator as well. Sarah, I'd like to see you. Yeah, well done. She's in the acting role, so we give her an acting applause. And then uh, we also have Sasha, who is the assistant to the solicitor for the city of St. Catharines, Sasha Spiteri. Got the name right? Look at that, eh? It's almost you think I was Italian. All right. 
Oh, it was like spaghetti, okay. All in favor, I need a motion to adjourn. Councillor Littleton, seconded by Councillor McPherson. All in favor? And that is carried. Have a wonderful day.